Mr Sullivan, you were the husband of Margaret Sullivan, correct? Correct. And uh, I'm going to be asking you today about the events that occurred in Newmarch House preceding Margaret's death, okay? Mm -hmm. You prepared a number of documents, including a statement for police. Do you have access to your statement today? Yes, I do. And, Your Honour, that's within tab 18, sorry, volume 18 at tab 4. Thank you. Uh, can you confirm, Mr Sullivan, that's a statement dated the 18th of August 2020? Yes, it is. And it runs to nine pages, is that right? I think there's yes. page numbers in the bottom right. Yeah, yeah, got them. Okay. Have, nine have have you had a chance to, sorry, we're talking over each other. Have you had a chance to read through that statement recently? Yes, uh, two or three times. Excellent. Are you happy the contents of that statement are true? Yes. Thank you. And you've also, do you have access to the annexures behind that statement, including a number of letters that you wrote? I've got some letters here. Um, I've got... Well, Mr uh, Sullivan, we, we might come to those a little later. If right. I have a document I need to show you, I'll try to do that via the video screen so that we can all see the same document. Do you understand? I do. Excellent. Okay, we'll, we'll just start with a little bit of the background. You've described in your statement um, the circumstances in which Margaret came to be in Newmarch House. But firstly, I understand you met Margaret back in 1968, is that right? Just yes, take yeah. Mr Sullivan, I can see, I, I take it this is an upsetting day for you. Is that right? Yes, it is. I, I'm hoping not to add to your distress, right. sir, but I can see that this is upsetting you. Do you need to take just a moment? No, right. Yeah, we met in 1968. Mm. And, and I think you were working in the ATO yourself back then, is that right? Yeah, we both were. And both of you from that point forward pursued careers as accountants, is that right? That's correct. And at one point, I think you're working in business together. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Well, she finished off her working career uh, in, uh, working with me in my business in Penrith. You have two sons. That's James and Sean. Is that right? That's correct. And among other things, what you tell us in the statement is that Margaret was a very strong Catholic. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Her, her faith was just unbelievable. I, even when she was in uh, in Newmarch, she never said anything badly about God. He was he. She said he would get her through this. Margaret's uh, health began to suffer uh, when she was about sixty-five. So in in two thousand thirteen, was that when you started to notice that she was becoming a bit unwell? Yeah, what happened, we, our youngest grandson got leukemia in 2012 and the shock, I think, was just uh, too much for him. In March 2013, she was working with me and she was a very, very good accountant and you could always rely on accuracy of her work. Um, and But there were times there in March 2013, the work was not up to scratch and she'd bring a pad paper in to the uh, into my room to get instructions. She never did that before. And I was wondering what was going on. So that was the start of it. Did you find she was becoming a bit forgetful and she needed prompting on things yes. she would normally have been able to do herself? Is that what happened? Correct. That's correct. And um, was it in 2016 that she was diagnosed with a form of dementia? Yes. Is that, that's and is, that, is that, to your understanding, called Lewy body disease? Yeah, uh, she was first diagnosed in, I think, March 2016. Uh, and then August 2016, uh, they worked out it was Lewy body dementia. And is one of the things that you understand about that illness is that it progresses very quickly? After a certain time, between 2013, uh, 14 and 15, uh, it wasn't progressing so quickly. Uh, 2016, it started gathering pace. 
2017 even faster. We had to, we were living together then, of course, and uh, she was going to a day centre run by Anglicare. Uh, first, it was one day a week, uh, then two days and uh, five days a week until uh, Christmas when I was told that she had become violent. She wasn't the calm Margaret that we all knew. She became violent. And in uh, March um, 2018, uh, the uh, people at uh, the daycare centre had a meeting between uh, my sons uh, and myself and advised that she go into New March House, which she did on the um, 20th of March 2018. And, and just picking up why you chose New March House, I, I think am I right, it was very close to where you were then living, is that right? Yeah, I, I looked at two places, uh, the Ponds and New March House. The Ponds was a much newer facility and it was about $100,000 dearer and it was a 40 minute trip. And so this was $100,000 cheaper and a two minute trip. So, you know, it wasn't that hard to, to work out. And New March had a great, had a great name. I, I really thought we won the lottery when, when uh, we, we placed it there. The people were just so wonderful. And I just want to ask you about that because putting your mind back to that period before lockdown, um, commenced in March of 2020. Am I right that in general terms, you had no concern with the care provided by the regular staff within New March House, is that right? They were so good that I even wrote a letter to uh, Anglicare praising the staff. Uh, the food was good, plenty of food, the staff were fantastic. The only weakness was on weekends where they had agency staff in and the agency staff in themselves were very, very good. but they didn't know the residents, so they couldn't give the finer personal touch. That was the only, only uh, uh, care I, um, concern I had, but on the whole, could not complain. And in, in terms of um, your role, if I can describe it like that, um, at this time, so prior to the lockdown in March 2020, uh, were you visiting Margaret every day? Yeah, every day, except for a, a three-week period when I was in hospital to have a knee operation, and uh, two or three days when I went with my son, he was going to give me a break. We went up to Queensland. Uh, that was in 2000 and... Uh, had to be 2019, January 2019. But other than that, it was every day. And that was for that whole two year period between Margaret entering the home and the lockdown yeah. commencing. Okay. Yeah. And what's, what sort of things were you doing for Margaret during that period? Um, I keep a company, of course, and initially 2018 and uh, the first half of 2019, uh, you, you could converse with her. She wouldn't know how the family was and, uh, and I would feed her every every day and make sure she, she ate well. Um, and some, sometimes I'd, I'd brush her hair or um, just little things and talk to her and just love that. I'm sorry, Mr Sullivan. I can see it's upsetting for you to think back about how Margaret was. Just take a moment. I'm OK. Oh, God. You you provided that sort of care for that whole two year period because you wanted to make sure that Margaret was well cared for and well loved during that time. Would that be a fair summary? Yeah, and because there was so many people, patients, I mean, or residents in there, the um, carers all run off their feet. And I thought that if I was there to at least to feed her and, and look after her, that would lessen the the burden on the carers. I couldn't do everything the carers did, of course. I tried that when she lived with me and uh, thinking back now, I, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how I looked after her 24-7 um, because there were two carers at a time with her and uh, and 
three shifts. So it took six people to look after for 24 hours. And I was doing on my own you know, for, for all those years. I was just wondered how I did it. But, you know, when you love someone. So I take it from what you've just said, Mr. Sullivan, that you needed the help of the carers to look yeah. after. Oh, yes. Issues. But yeah, did you also sure. feel did you also feel that you were an important part of Margaret's care as well? Yes, my word, I was. Well, in that context, I want to move to the commencement of the lockdown. So to give you the date on the 23rd of March in the evening of the 23rd of March 2020, Newmarch House was placed into lockdown, as were other care homes the following day. Um, I just want to put your mind back to that point in time. Did that cause you any concern about the care that Margaret was going to receive from that point forward? Yes, it did. Uh, it, it caused me concerns in a couple of areas. One was she wouldn't be getting the same care that I that she got before COVID. Number and two, why did you, you say that, Mr. Sullivan? Ah, uh, because I wouldn't be there. Uh, and number two, she would be totally confused. Uh, uh, she wasn't. Uh, she wasn't with it uh, in in March two thousand twenty, and um, unless I was there to explain things to her, uh, she wouldn't accept what other people said. She trusted me a thousand percent, and. Um, uh, uh, I've just lost, lost my train of thought. That, that's right, Mr. Sullivan. Was it is is this the case that because of your concerns, you spoke to the manager at the home? That's Melinda Burns. Yeah. And the next day, on the Tuesday, Tuesday, I went down uh, to talk to Melinda and ask her, well, to firstly to reconsider uh, the lockdown, and secondly, uh, and when she said no, we can't do it, I said, well. <clears throat> Let me move in with Margaret and um, I'll look after her and that'll save some carers looking after her. And she said, no, you can't do that. And I said, look, she said, none of the family can come in and, and look after their loved ones. And I said, do you realise what you are saying? Because there are, there were, I think there's four different wards in Newmarch and um, there would be probably 25% of each of the residents have someone looking after them at either dinner or lunch. So if you take Laxland, for example, there would have been four or five, maybe six residents who have been looked after every lunch and every dinner. So you, that means if you compound that by the number of un units, that's that much extra care the carers have to give. And they didn't have extra carers. I said it won't work. So, so bring it bring it down to the particular case of Margaret. Is this right that you were concerned that if you weren't able to attend to help with her keeping her company, talking to her, and feeding her, that you didn't know the staff would be able to cope with that without your help? Right. Is that the effect of it? That's right. And and uh, you had that conversation with Melinda Burns about that issue. Did you also follow that up with a letter that you wrote to her? Yes, I went and saw Dr. Park, Margaret's doctor, and explained the situation. And he agreed with me that Margaret needed me there. And he wrote a, a letter to Melinda Burns. And I don't even know if she if she looked at it because she contacted me a day later, which was a Wednesday now. Uh, and she said, "No, um, uh, we're not we're not going to change our minds." And then I wrote another letter. Just to get this in context, one of the letters you wrote, we have at Annex Share A to your statement, that stated the 26th of March 2020. Uh, do, you have, do you have access to that letter at the moment, or can I no, just read it? No, 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 I can't okay. find it. I'm for it this morning. Okay, okay. It's, it's Annex Share A behind your statement, and it commences, Dear Mrs. Burns, you refer to the letter from the CEO date of the 23rd of March 2020. And you, you're raising this issue you've, you've just been discussing in evidence. I just want to read one short passage. This is page 11 behind the statement of Anningshire A. And it says this final paragraph, quote, I know you are short-staffed and that a heavier demand has been placed on all of your staff 
So it's not possible for your staff to do as I did with Margaret to stimulate her. Also, they wouldn't have the love and affection for her that I do. And you complete that, that, sent that uh, letter by saying, in summary, I respectfully ask you to take another look and apply reasonable duty of care to Margaret's circumstances by allowing me to feed her at lunch and dinner, thus ensuring she receives the stimulus she requires. Do, do you recall writing that letter? Yes, I did. Yeah, I remember it. And, and was it a response to that? Did, did you have a, refer, a further response to that from Mrs Burns or somebody else within Anglicare? Yeah, she said no, but then I sent another letter uh, and, and appealed uh, her, her decision and the appeal was knocked back. Ultimately, you weren't permitted to attend at the facility just as the other resident, residents' families were not attended, uh, permitted to attend and care for the residents. Is that your understanding? That's one hundred percent right, and I, I got to know a lot of uh, the visitors there. And there was one lady there; I, I can't remember her name, but she actually gave up a job to look after her mum, and she was beside herself um, when the, the, the decision was made for, for nobody to go in there. It was totally dramatic. I, I, I just can't describe how everybody felt um because we all have our loved ones and they all are very special to us and to take something away like that is horrendous absolutely horrendous mr sullivan did you find it very stressful worrying about who was going to be looking after margaret during that lockdown period i was concerned about it uh, but on the last day the lockdown day the beautiful carers there said don't worry Lloyd we'll ring you and let you know how she's going and we'll ring you around six o'clock and they did it for a couple of days maybe four days but <clears throat> then they were taken off I don't think they were working there after that um, well, one thing you were able to do was initially you had a window visit with Margaret on I think the 31st of March 2020 Correct. is that right and Correct. you hadn't by that time seen Margaret for a number of days is that right for a week for a, a week, week. Yeah. so between yeah. the lockdown commencing and the 31st of March you hadn't seen her for a week that's right, right. and yep. when you saw her how was that Mr Sullivan how was it to see her again she was like a child She was so happy. <laughs> she was so excited just to see me at the window. And oh, she was like a child waving her arms around. And she was very childlike mentally. And uh, I was there for about 45 minutes and just talking through the, through the glass. And I was told that we could do that every day. And I thought, oh, this is all right. I, I, I can I, I can live with this. And then half an hour later, I get a phone call from Mrs. Burns' son, who also worked there. He was a carer, a nice guy too. And um, he said, look, I'm sorry. Uh, you can't visit. Oh, nobody, nobody can visit uh, their relatives any, any, uh, through the window. Did you later find out that, in fact, window visits had carried on, although you didn't know about it? Correct. And uh, as a result, the way that you had contact with Margaret was by uh, video calls. Is that the case? Yeah, that was, uh, video calls were the case, but it was a hell of a mess. Um, there was problems with equipment problems with carers knowing how to work the equipment, um, getting carers getting back to us and, and, and uh, having video calls. But I managed to have probably half a dozen video calls and uh, I appreciated that. It was only 30 seconds, but to see her, she couldn't talk, but just to look at her. And, and Mr Sullivan, I, I take it that you found those video calls to be valuable, even though you couldn't talk to Margaret at that time. That's correct. And just thinking about how Margaret's presentation was at this time, you told me previously that she had 
deteriorated prior to going into New March House. What was the yeah. level of function by the time we get to March 2020? Was she able no, to talk no. at all? No, 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 she couldn't talk. Look, last thing she said to me in uh, coherent terms was December the 29th. And she said, she got up from the bed, just, she says, there's my man, I love him very much. <laughs> That's the last thing she said to me. But January, February, March, April, she couldn't talk. She was like, she was a vegetable. She really was. Couldn't take care of herself in any way, shape or form. She was funny though, and she was losing her uh, taste for food, except for sweets. She enjoyed the sweets. And, and did, uh, she, did she need help with feeding or was she able to feed herself? No, no, you had to help her. No. You know, you had to put the spoon in her mouth and and uh, help her swallow. Um, and did the helpers help her with her other care needs as well? Oh, with yes. Yeah, okay. And, and in terms of um, moving about, was she able to move about on her own or did she need help with no. her? No, no. She was in bed. And if uh, before um, COVID, before lockdown, we used to put her in a, a, a tub chair and move her into the uh, meal room uh, and and feed her and feed her then. But she couldn't. She could, she could not do anything. Mr. Sullivan, I just want to move forward to the point in time when you first became aware of the COVID uh, positive result. Do you remember how you found out about that result? Do you remember that you received, do you remember, and this is paragraph 25 of your statement, that in the afternoon of the 18th of April, yeah. you received yeah. a call from Leanne, Leanne Hinton, the, uh, the care manager within New March House? Yeah, that was my birthday and we were celebrating, it's just about to uh, cut open the cake and the phone rang and Leanne told me that Margaret was positive and I nearly fell through the floor. And I gave the phone to my daughter-in-law and I said, Rich, I can't, I can't talk. And she said, what's wrong? Anyway, uh, Leanne spoke to her and, I, and to my son, but I don't know what was said. And I, I just, uh, I, could have, I was just nuts. I was dumbfounded. I, I, I don't know the word, I, I just, didn't even know I was I was existing. It, it was it was a shock of my life. I mean, the lockdown was a shock, but this was a, a terrible shock. Mr. Sullivan, I acknowledge this must have been devastating news for you to receive. I want to ask you about another call that we have a note of that occurred that day. Okay, um, I don't know if we're able to put this up on screen. This is volume eighteen, tab eight. At page 153 it's progress notes uh, and what I might do actually Mr. Um, Mr Sullivan is read you the note because it's relatively short it, it appears to be an entry by a GP by the name of Dr Graydon G-R-A-Y-D-O-N for the record and just listen to me this because I'm just going to ask if you recall this conversation or if not and, and, I, and I understand um, because the way you've described your state of mind at the time um, but just in that context, it says this. Margaret's usual GP is Dr. Anthony Park, but he was not contactable today. He'll be contacted on Monday, 20th of the 4th, 20, to, give, to be given an update on her condition. I spoke to her husband, Lloyd Sullivan, and son, Sean, at 1.45pm today after they were informed of his wife's swab. I think the note is now being shown up on screen for you, and it's just down to the right-hand corner there, commencing with the word Graydon. Um, I'll, just, I'll just continue reading, um, if you can hear me, Mr Sullivan. It, right. sa it says uh, the following, we discussed updating her advanced care plan in the context of her COVID infection. I advise the residents at Newmarch House were under the care of the hospital in the home team. This includes access to oxygen, oral and injectable medications to provide comfort and relief of pain and breathing difficulties. It does not intubation or ventilation, it says. The family, it, it then says the following, the family declined the offer to make a final decision on the ACP. I, I think that means advanced care plan. 
details till they had a chance to have a whole family discussion. Now, it's a lot of material to read out to you, but can I ask you these questions? One, do you recall receiving a, a, do you recall receiving a call from a GP called Dr. Graydon that day? That's the same day that you were informed about the COVID test. I don't recall receiving a phone call. I do recall the name, Dr. Graydon, his name's familiar to me. I do remember Sean on the phone, but I don't know what was said. Um, and I, I, I think the doctor spoke to me, but I have not a clue what he was talking about. I, I really have no idea. And, and Mr. Sullivan, in fairness, is that because of your state of mind at the time, given the news that you just received? Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, do you remember, um, uh, not at this time, but about June the previous year, you just bear with me a moment, please, sorry. Can I just clarify something, um, Mr. Sullivan? Um, in the in the answer there, you said you didn't understand the thing the doctor was saying. Can I just be clear? Do you, do you have a recollection of having a conversation with the doctor this day? Um, look, this morning I, I wouldn't have remembered a thing about it, but now that you've, you've mentioned it, yeah. It's very, very vague. Very vague. Okay. And, and when you say very vague, you're, me having read through the doctor's entry, yeah. is there anything about it that you can recall having been said or anything you disagree with in what I read out? I can't disagree with anything because I just don't remember. Okay. Um, I, do you recall the year previously that there had been advance an advanced care plan created for Margaret. Yes. What, what I might do is show you a copy of that document on screen now. This is the same volume, volume 18, at tab 9, please. And just to put this in context, this is a document, uh, it's page 1 of that tab, um, a document that's created, uh, appears to be created on the 19th, oh, sorry, on, on the 5th of June 2019, and it appears to bear your name and your signature, and it's headed Advanced Care Plan. I'll just ask that to be put up now. Okay. Can you see that document, Mr. Sullivan? I can. Okay. And do you remember me sh having shown you this? Do you remember this document being created? Oh, yes. Can I just ask you about the circumstances? W was there a discussion between you and anywhere, anyone within Newmarch House about completing this document? Probably Melinda Burns. I can't, I won't, I wouldn't swear to that, but it was uh, some one senior in, in Newmarch. Uh, now, I don't remember if I approached them or they approached me, um, but I was quite conscious of having everything in place uh, for for Margaret. So uh, this was the end of life um, instructions, wasn't it? Well, if we just read it through together, there's a number of boxes ticked that you can- uh, I haven't seen on the screen. Okay, well, let, let me read them out. There's the first one which says, uh, under a heading cardiopulmonary resuscitation, so CPR, it says, I do want cardiopulmonary resuscitation commenced, triple O called for further emergency treatment and transfer to hospital. Mm -hmm. And the next box that's ticked in the middle of the page is, I do not wish to be kept alive by being fed artificially. Yep. And were these matters which you understood to be consistent with Margaret's wishes at that time in June of 2019? Oh, yeah, we had discussed this and we uh, based our will on it. Um, back in 2017. And the, the next box that text says this, I do want to receive oral antibiotics 
I understand intravenous administration of antibiotics may require transfer to hospital. Just pausing there, what was your understanding of Margaret's wishes in terms of whether she wanted to receive antibiotics and how that might be administered to her? I don't really know. Um, do, do you have a clear recollection now of what discussions you had with Margaret on that topic of antibiotics and how she might be given them? Uh, I, I just don't recall. Okay. And that's, that's quite all right. I'll move on to the next box that's ticked. It's under a heading hospital transfer. And it says, I do, I do want to be transferred to hospital if medically indicated. Yeah. I just want to ask about that. What was your understanding of Margaret's wishes about being transferred to hospital? Uh, just as she says, uh, if it got to the stage where they couldn't care for her properly at Newmark, she wanted to be transferred to, uh, to Nepean. And this was in uh, June of 2019. Mm -hmm. Do you recall there being any discussion about this document prior to the lockdown being imposed in March of 2020? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Do you remember there being any dis any further discussion about this document prior to the lockdown in twenty no. in March twenty twenty? No, not at all. Okay. And what about? Uh, sorry, I'll I'll move you forward because I've asked you about that discussion with Dr. Graydon on yeah. the eighteenth uh, of April, the day that you were informed of Margaret's COVID result. Th there's another note that I want to ask you about, um, and this is within volume eighteen tab six at page five and just to put this in context this is about six days later mr sullivan so we're going to show you a document in a moment about recording a discussion that's said to occur that day between yourself and a nurse called Haley carpen and a doctor called dr sharma okay firstly do you remember there being a discussion about six days after the covid result with those two people no, not off the top of my head, no. Okay. Well, let me show you the document and see if this helps you, uh, uh, see if this uh, jogs your memory at all. So it's a note that's recorded at about uh, 5.55 in the evening. And it says this, under the heading Advanced Care Plan, it says, Dr. Sharma has had a conversation today with Mrs. Margaret Sullivan's husband and son. Just pausing there, it doesn't say which son. Uh, uh, probably continue... James. Probably James, okay. Yeah. It, it continues, Margaret is known to have dementia with Lewy body, osteoporosis dependent on all ADLs. Uh, we understand that is activities of daily living. It, though, it then goes on, family had lots of questions. Dr. Sharma explained to them about COVID and that there is no developed cure Care that is provided is supportive care. Based on her underlying condition, Dr. Sharma has promoted for quality of Margaret's life. Dr. Sharma has recommended to the family that she is best treated within the RACF, that means New March. Uh, she is not for transfer to hospital and not for intubation and ventilation. Margaret is to have supportive care at the facility if she deteriorates, her husband and son want to be notified. I've read you a lot of text there, but my first question is, me having read that out, do you, does that jog your memory at all as to a d discussion occurring with Dr. Sharma and Nurse Carpen that day? I have no, honestly, I have no recollection of it. I, let, I, I do not remember a thing. Let, let me put it this way. Do you recall, um, we can, Put the document down for the moment, thank you. Do you have, thank you. Do you have any discussion of there, sorry, withdraw that. Do you have any recollection of there being a discussion at any time after Margaret's COVID diagnosis about this issue of advanced care plans, first of all? 
No, I, I honestly I don't remember anything. My my mind was was just dead. I and just don't remember anything. I left everything, a lot of things, to James and to James and Sean uh, because I just couldn't cope. Okay, let me ask you about a particular couple of particular points, just in light of that answer. Do you remember a recommendation being given to yourself or to the family at any stage that Margaret was best treated within Newmarch House? I, I, I don't Objects. remember, but I won't say. Sorry, Mr Sullivan, it's just the, it's the coroner speaking. Sorry to interrupt. Um, it's just a matter that's been raised in court, which I just have to deal with for a moment. Just bear with me. The witness has said, I don't remember a thing. Now things are going to be suggested to him that he can remember or not remember. Well, Your Honour, he said he doesn't recall this this conversation. Yes. I'm exploring whether at any stage he recalls being advised or asked about these matters. Yes. So that's the distinction I'm trying to make. Yes. I think it's a different question, Mr Fordham. I think he actually said more than that. He was talking about the period. Um, my note is at any time um, after... Um, Margaret's COVID positive result. Um, I'll allow the question. Go on, Mr. Harris. I'll, I'll endeavour to clarify during these questions. Um, Mr. Sullivan, what I'm asking is that whether at any time after the COVID diagnosis you recall a discussion on the following topics, okay? And, and if you mm -hmm. don't recall, then say so. And if oh, you do oh. recall, then, then tell us what you can recall, okay? So, so the first part is. Do you recall it being recommended to you or the family that uh, Margaret is best treated within Newmarch House? Do you, do you recall that being said? I'm honestly trying to remember, and I, I just can't recall. But I wouldn't say it didn't happen. Um, I don't even remember going down to Newmarch House. Okay. okay. And the, the next point I want to ask you about is, do you recall, sorry, the, the end of your answer was you don't recall going down to, to Newmarch House. Um, in your following answers, if you can bring to mind either a phone conversation or a meeting, okay, so it may not be an attendance at, at Newmarch House, but something that happened over the phone. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the next point I want to ask you about this, do you recall being advised or told Sorry, withdraw that. Do you, do you recall having a discussion around Margaret being not for transfer to hospital, firstly? Um, very vaguely, very, very vaguely. If it didn't, if it didn't bring it up, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known about it. Do you recall there being any discussion about these procedures being not for intubation and ventilation? Yeah, look, um, some of that's coming back to me. Um, most of the conversation I just, I didn't understand. I didn't know what they meant by it. I mean, if you ask me today, I'd know. But at that time, um, I had no idea what was going on. And when you say you don't, didn't understand what they meant by it, who are you referring to? Uh, the the doctor or the, or the nurse, whoever was there. Um, I was confused. Uh, I was in disbelief because we'd been told that for a number of days that she was going, uh, going well. And uh, so, yeah, I was, I was just totally confused. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, the, the final point I want to ask you is um, whether you recall a discussion to this effect, if Margaret deteriorates, you and your son want to be notified. But that, that would have been said for sure. Yeah. Okay. And, and 
in terms of your, your, your wishes, doing the best you can, is the things that I've read out to you consistent or different to what you wanted to happen to Margaret at this point in time after she'd been discovered to be COVID positive? Sorry, we withdraw the question. Um, putting your mind back at that point in time, after Margaret, Margaret had been found to be COVID positive, what did you want to happen to her in terms of transfer to hospital? I think I wanted her to be transferred to hospital um, because, because of that form that was filled out before. Um, and I thought there was a, a lot of problems at Newmarch uh, and I think there were problems beyond uh, their scope of or beyond their expertise. And also, Margaret's uh, sister, uh, Kathy, she uh, she would have been, she, she's a registered nurse, had been doing it for 40 years. Uh, and uh, she was, she wanted Margaret to be put into the hospital, the Pern Hospital. I remember her t t talking to me about it. Very well. Um, can you remember at any point in time raising that issue that is transferred to hospital with any members of staff? <clears throat> no, I can't remember that at all. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move forward in the timeline. Okay. Yeah. Uh, about four days after the events I've been asking about, on the 28th of April, we understand that you received a call from Melinda Burns. You deal yes. with this at paragraph 28 of your statement, and this is when she said words to the effect that she thought Margaret was dying. That's correct. She said, come down quickly because Margaret won't last the night. And I rang uh, James and Sean, and they, flipped, they came up. <laughs> and um, I spent an hour with Margaret and James and Sean spent half an hour each because we were only allowed two visitors at a time. Um, um, when you did that, that, what did you have to do in terms of wearing PPE? What were the circumstances? Oh, the whole lot. Yeah, yeah. That, that that was a strange thing too. We were asked questions and had put the full headgear on and everything else we had to put on. But when I looked around in the reception, there was a maintenance man who I knew well going through without any protection on, not even a ma mask, and I couldn't believe it. And uh, but we wore the, the full the full gear. Okay. And did you see her in her room? Yeah, it was lovely. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to know what to say to someone. And I, because Margaret was so religious, I said, um, we said the Deckers of the Rosary. And she knew I was there because she put her hand out to put into my hand. And her lips were moving. Uh, couldn't hear what she was saying, but I said the rosary with her. And um, then <clears throat> on the 29th, I was allowed to go back in and I was there for about seven minutes. And um, I had a good old chat to her and just so she knew I was there. It was very important for her to know that I was there when she died. It was a kind of a pact we made when we first got married, and I, uh, and I wanted so much to honour that pact, and what uh, upset me too was the fact that Margaret's brothers, sisters, eight of them, her maiden names Brady, so we used to call them the Brady Bunch, and they were such, such a lovely family, and uh, still are, of course, but they couldn't see her; they weren't allowed anywhere near her. And I felt so terrible for them. But at least I, I saw I saw her those, those two days. And for that, I was so thankful. But for her brothers and sisters, 
they were such a close family. As I said, she was her second mum. They had lost the mum, uh, the real mum, only a year before that. So tough times. Mr Sullivan, I think, is it right, on the 6th of May, you were able to have a window visit with Margaret? Correct. That was a Wednesday. That, that was, in fact, the last time that you did see Margaret prior to her death. Is that right? No, 6th of May, we had a window visit. 8th of May and Mother's Day, the 10th of May, uh, we were, the family was allowed to, to have a visit, but it was only immediate family, not her brothers or sisters. Uh, it was just the boys and um, grandchildren and daughters-in-law, and we had to make a booking for uh, for those visits. Now, on the day she died, on the Monday that she died, the 11th of, of May, I got a phone call from Newmarch saying, uh, Margaret died at quarter past three in the morning. I got a phone call from Newmarch uh, advising us that uh, we could have a window visit for the following day. And I said, well, she's passed away. So, you know, those types of things just annoy you. Yeah. And I think, as you tell us in your statement, was there also an issue around how you became aware of Margaret's death? In terms of who was informed? Yeah, look, uh, the day before, two days before she died, I got a phone call from the nurse saying something about Margaret. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, I said I want to be notified first. But when she died, they notified Sean first. And, and then he rang me. And I think they notified him around four o'clock. It wasn't straight away. And what did you think of that? Well, I just thought it was typical of New March, couldn't get their act together if the life depended on it. And uh, bearing in mind that those poor people who worked in their you know, in horrendous circumstances they were working. But so man management seemed to be lacking, lacking care and empathy um, and good business practice. Um, the communication uh, <clears throat> between March 23rd uh, and the day she died was appallingly bad, appallingly bad. And uh, their management just couldn't get their act together. I want to ask about one piece of communication in particular. Do, do you recall that about a week, just less than a week before Margaret's death, you received a call from Dr. James Brandley? This was on the 6th of May, 2020. Yep. And do you recall the thing? He, together with Cameron Elliott from within New March House, contacted you yep. and they informed you about Margaret's condition at that time and indeed her COVID status. Is that right? Correct. What, what was your understanding of the conversation? What, what, what did you understand you were being told? Uh, I think, I think um, that she was uh, very, very sick and she probably wouldn't make it. And in terms of her COVID status at that time, did you understand that she was still positive or not? I just assumed she, she was because I didn't hear anything to the, to the opposite. Do you recall being informed by uh, Dr. Branley um, on the day of Margaret's passing that there had been negative tests for her, that is, COVID negative tests? Yes, he rang me at 7 a.m. and told me she was now negative uh, as of 11.55 the previous evening. Um, yes, I do recall that conversation. And is it as a result of that, your understanding is that Margaret ultimately died because of her Lewy body disease? Is that your understanding? Yeah, yeah well, that was more than understanding. I'm pretty sure the doctor said that to me. Um, Mr Sullivan, I've been asking a lot of questions about the events that occurred. I just want to ask you if there's anything, other reflections that you have about that period in New March House, either positive or negative, that you want to tell his honour. Um, 
I, th I think you've covered most of it, but the only thing I'd like to do is to thank uh, His Honour for allowing this inquest to commence and also to thank him for rejecting the application from Anglicare to stop the proceedings. Is there anything else that you want to say in terms of your experience that you haven't said already today? No. Ms Sullivan, thank you. Those are questions for me. There may be questions for others at this point. Mr Sullivan, it's the coroner speaking again. I'm just going to check with the other lawyers whether they might have any questions for you. So if you wouldn't mind just bearing with me for a moment. Um, Ms Clark, did you have any questions for Mr Sullivan? Um, one moment, Your Honour, I'm just checking. Certainly. No, I've got no further questions for Mr Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr Palfrey, do you have any questions for Mr Sullivan? No, thank you, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, Ms Davidson, do you have any questions? No questions, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, Mr Fordham, do you have any questions for Mr Sullivan? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Ms Bridgerton, any questions for Mr Sullivan? No, thank you, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, well, Mr Sullivan, um, it's the coroner speaking again. Um, there are no more questions um, for you, so that means that um, we've reached the end of your evidence. Um, thank you very much for dialling in to the court this morning to give that evidence. Um, I can see that you were visibly distressed by it, and so I appreciate the time that you've given us today. Um, you're now welcome to um, end the um, connection um, with the court. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honour. Your Honour, the next witness is uh, Mary, Mary Watson. Yes. And I call Ms Watson. Thank you, ma'am. Please have a seat. Thank you. Is your name Mary Watson? Yes. And um, are you the daughter of Alice Bake? And of course, we know that Alice, your mother, was the last resident to pass away in the cohort of 19 residents who died during the outbreak. Yes. Now, just some background information first. Um, your mother, Alice, um, had worked during her life in a nursing, um, in nursing homes, correct? Correct. Where she was employed as a carer. Um, later on in life, she worked as a nanny until she retired, correct? Yes. Um, you also, well, you had a background in nursing personally, correct? That's right. Um, can you just tell the court what work you did during your working life? I trained as a registered nurse at the Old Kids Hospital in Camperdown, and then I worked in a few general hospitals, and I finished working as part of Westmead Hospital in geriatric rehab. How long did you work for in the geriatric area? Four years. Um, Alice Bacon, um, was married to your father, Charles Stewart Bacon, right? Um, 
Mr. Bacon, predeceased your mother by some years. Um, you have two sisters. Two sisters and one brother. And one brother. Your sisters are called Alison. Yes. And Irene, who is known as Joyce. And then um, there is a brother as well named John. Yes. And is it the case that Alison worked at Newmarch House? She did. At one time? She worked there from about 2016 and through the pandemic. She was sidelined, of course, being close contact. She went back for a few weeks, went off again, and then finished up in October 2020. Um, can I ask you some questions just about your mother's general health? Um, in the years before she was admitted into Newmarch House. Um, You say in your statement that she was quite healthy throughout her life? Yes. Um, she had asthma? Yes. And she used a Ventolin uh, via a nebulizer for asthma uh, medication. Um, is it the case that in her, when aged in her 50s, she developed ischemic heart disease, disease and hypertension. And she received medication for the ischemic, for those conditions, correct? Or managed well with the drugs. Right. And did that include a patch that was put on her chest, which delivered medication for the heart condition? Um, your mother was admitted to Newmarch House in 2016, is that correct? Correct. At that time, was she mobile? Yes, her mobility was being re it was reduced. She had lived at my sister and brother-in-law's house for the 18 years prior. She was starting to have the odd falls, so and being lonely. And that's why she moved to Newmarch. In terms of mobility, um, did she use a walker? To... Eventually, she used. She went from a, nothing to a walking stick, and then to the four wheel walker. Right. When she was admitted into Newmarch in two thousand and sixteen, was she using the walker at that stage? No, I believe she was still on the stick. Still on the stick at that stage. While we're on the subject of mobility, I'll just jump forward in time. Um, in early 2020, so yes. close to the time that we're interested in in this inquest, at that stage she was using the four-wheel walker, is that right? Um, could she move around her room without the walker? Very much so. She was very independent and resisted any kind of artificial using. She saw that as a weakness pushing that trolley around. When would she use the walker? When she was out of her room. All right. Did she move around the residential aged care facility? Oh, yes, yeah, she walked and walked. She'd walk outside, she'd walk around the corridors. She was active. I'd like to ask you about her mental state. Um, and I'll confine my the time period to early 2020, that period leading up to the outbreak. Um, how would you describe her level of alertness? She was, she was sharp. She, she didn't miss the beat. She knew everything that was going on at Newmarch.
in the period, um, in that period, how often would you be speaking with your mother? Um, I would speak to her on the phone once a week and would go on a Saturday and pick her up and take her home. Right. We'll come to those um, forms of contact. But against that background, when you had conversations with your mother, um, how would you describe the level of lucidity of those conversations? It was fine. She could tell us what was going on. She knew what was going on in the world. She knew everything that was happening about. Was she an anxious woman? Yes. And have there been um, moments of depression? Yes. How did the anxiety manifest itself? Um, she would become um, irritable. Um, she had to stay busy, so she was always knitting rather than fidgeting. Um, she was medicated. She had antidepressants. Let's go back to 2016 uh, when Alice was admitted into Newmarch House. How is it that you came to choose Newmarch? My sister worked there. We knew it was a good um, facility. Our local GP also said it was one of the better ones. So we were a win-win. It was close to three sisters. We all lived you know, within 20 minutes. It was central. So we could all get there and visit. And having Alison working there, she could see her every day. It was it was good. She was right. happy. And in those in that early period, was she happy at Newmarch House? Yeah, she did resist moving the change, but yes. she made friendships, church groups. She ad ended up adapting well. She made friends. She was very popular in there. She was 89 years age when, when she 89 in. years of age when she entered. Is that right? Um, your mother was in the Lawson wing in room C5. Mm -hmm. um, she had a landline phone in her room. Is that right? Lifeline. She called. Is that what it was called? It was her lifeline. That was her lifeline. Um, can you just describe what that phone? looked like in terms of the buttons on it, please? We got her, and we'd only recently done that because she used to press all our numbers in and sometimes she'd make mistakes. So we got a one that we could program in our numbers and we put a face on it. So if she wanted to press ring Mary, she pressed me. If she wanted to ring Joyce, she pressed Joyce. It made it much easier for but her. There was a, there was a, for example, there was a single button with a photo of you on it, and all your mother had to do was pick up the phone and press your face to be able to be connected with you. Yes. And that was in place before the outbreak yes. commenced. Just coming back to um, um, her activities at the home, um, you mentioned that you would pick her up mm -hmm. and take her away from the home yes. for outings. Um, and that includes coming back to the family home, I take it? Yes. Um, you also mentioned that she um, was active in the home. What sort of things did she do in the home in terms of keeping busy? All bus trips. She, her name was down first. <laughs> she loved to get out. She joined in their um, Bible studies that they had once a week. She wasn't a great fan of going to the main room for the entertainment. Sometimes the staff could encourage her to go. But, you know, she liked just chatting and going out. She had taxi vouchers initially and she was always going down to Penrith or to St Mary's where she knew most of the shopkeepers. Um, in, the, in her room itself, was it the case that she used to make her own bed? Oh, she made her own bed. She changed the linen. She she was very independent and she took care of all her self-care. Mm. And um, in terms of activities that she 
engaged in in the dining room, for example? What sort of things did she um, do there? She went for meals. She would set the breakfast tables all up. That was her job. And she would often help clear as well. She was quite friendly with the kitchen staff, so she liked to help. Right. Just coming back to um, the history of health um, issues just before her admission, um, she'd had a, an experience of gallstones at one point in time. That was in January 2020. And um, that resulted in a transfer to Nepean Hospital for treatment for that condition? Yes. And while she was at Nepean, is it the case that um, certain symptoms were regarded as possibly... That was when she came back to Newmarch. All right, but just explain what happened after um, she came back. She was... She had noticed to have lost weight. She was having... Um, bloody stools that they tested and there was blood in them. So a conversation with Dr. Graydon, who, who was her GP at that time, myself and mum, we discussed whether that should be further investigated. He spoke to a gastroenterologist at Nepean Hospital who said that she would not be a candidate for any kind of um, Surgical investigations or surgery. Yes. So it was decided by mum, myself, and the doctor that the symptoms would be managed as they appeared. Right. Was the landing position that the view was taken that it was likely that she had bowel cancer? That's correct. Um, but um, it was not regarded as appropriate in her case to um, treat it with surgery. Was the, was the possible or probable diagnosis ever actually confirmed? No. It was left at that. Um, and in terms of the symptoms that she experienced, you've just referred to a physical symptom, but apart from that? Um, nausea. Nausea. And loss of appetite. Coming back to the issue of visits, um, how often would family members visit um, your mother before the outbreak? Myself, every Saturday morning we would pick her up. Yes. Um, my sister Joyce also, and Joyce would also drop in one day during the week on her way home from work, and she saw my sister every day that she worked. And, of course, you know, grandchildren, great-grandchildren visited as well. Any occasions, birthdays, any kind of celebrations, she was, we got her and she joined the family for those. In early 2020, were you in employment? Yes. Right. You'd left nursing at that stage? Yeah. What were you doing at that time? I was the director of an early childhood service. Um, you provided a statement uh, to the police. That statement was provided in August of 2020. Yes. As part of the coronial investigation. That's right. Um, when you prepared that statement, um, you had various notes that you had taken, is that correct? Do you have a copy of your statement with you? I do. Ms Watson, and can I ask you, just to look behind the notes, you'll see um, that there are some handwritten note entries. For the record, they start at page 26 of the PDF file of the statement, which is tab 4 of volume 19. You see those handwritten. Are these my handwritten notes? Yes, and I might just ask for page twenty-six of 
tab four, just to be put up on the screen, please. There's the first page, and perhaps if we just scroll through, you'll see that there are other pages. Mm -hmm. um, can you just explain the circumstances in which those notes were taken? Um, I went to Newmarch House on the 2nd of the 6th. I'd made an appointment at 2.30, and my sister and I went through and reviewed all my mum's care notes, and I made notes from them. Okay, so um, this was after your mother had yeah. passed away. In June. In June, you actually physically attended New March and requested that you be shown progress notes. And that was permitted, and you made handwritten notes based on what you're reading. The, the notes that you were shown at Newmarch House, were they in electronic form or written form or both? Initially, I was shown the um, computer generated ones, their iCare, iCare app. Yes. And uh, there was an RN sitting beside me in case I had questions. I was told I wasn't allowed to photocopy or co call state photos, so hence my handwritten notes. As I was reviewing those, I saw on a particular date that um, what's her name? Melinda had noted that they were going off the electronic notes onto handwritten notes. So then I asked for the handwritten notes, which they didn't have available that type at that time. So I went back at another date and I went through the handwritten notes and made more notes. I see. Just coming back to page 26. You see at the top of the page it says two stroke six two thirty. Yep. Is that the basis yep. upon which you say that you think you went there on the second of June or two thirty? That's the date that I put there, so that was yep. the date I went. Okay. When you made your statement with the police, you had those notes with you. Yes. By the looks of things. So in your statement when you talk about the notes oh. saying this or the notes saying that and they're number of times in your statement where we see that type of reference, you're referring to the medical notes or progress notes that you're able to inspect Correct. at um, Newmarch House. You refer to receiving an email on the 18th of March 2020 from Newmarch House Administration, mm -hmm. um, which concerned um, changed visiting That's right. procedures because of the COVID outbreak <clears throat> that was occurring in New South Wales. And then on the 23rd of March, of course, there was the lockdown at Newmarch House, which, mm -hmm. which we've heard evidence about. Um, and then that progressed to a, a more complete lockdown on about the 11th of April. Yes. Um, it says in your statement, this is a paragraph 12, we were assured by all in authority acting for the home my mother was in safe hands and being well cared for. And that assurance that you're referring to, um, is that a reference to the emails that you received from yes. New March management? Absolutely. They listed very clearly all the actions that they were going to be taking to ensure that COVID didn't get into New March. So from that, I was reassured that they were going to be cared for and kept safe. Those emails, you can take it, are in evidence. Um, was there any other type of assurance you're referring to, or was it just the emails? Um, no, we had conversations with staff. Right. Nursing staff or management staff, are you able to? Sorry? My sister, who was working there. Yes. 
but you know, this is this is what we needed to do to keep COVID out of Newmarch. So of course, you know, we weren't happy about it, but we didn't want it getting in, so we complied mm -hmm. very much so. On the twenty first of March, um, your sister Joyce and her husband visited Alice. And then, when they finished their visit, um, you, with your husband Jeff, visited your mother, and she appeared. Well, how did she appear at that time? You see us. We were, you know, in a room with her, talking, talking about the kids, how everybody was. She was happy. Then, on the twenty third, <clears throat> um, the lockdown commences. Now, is that the moment when in-person visits stop for you? Yes, that's right. They were locked down. We were no longer allowed to go to Newmarch. All right. <clears throat> How are you maintaining contact with your mother after 23 March? On the phone. All right. All of us, constantly. Um, how often were you speaking to her from that point onwards on uh, the telephone? We tried to share it between ourselves. So I would ring, Joyce would ring first in the morning when she got to work. I would ring, I think, in the middle of the day, and my sister Alison would ring in the afternoon. So calls multiple times per day? Absolutely. Between Alice and someone in the family? And was that the general pattern that? And all her friends would be ringing. She was very involved in her church and her Bible studies group. So they were all ringing as well to make sure she was okay. When the home went into lockdown on the 23rd of March, did you discuss with your mother what was happening? Yeah, we knew that, you know, there was COVID. She watches the news, she knew what was going on. And we just kept reassuring her that, you know, it was to keep her safe. So she understood there was a COVID outbreak? Yes. Did she understand the home was in lockdown and you couldn't visit her? Oh, yes. <laughs> and there were discussions about that situation? Absolutely. Did she understand why she needed to stay in her room? Um, that occurred after the first positive case. Right. Before At that stage, she was still moving around? They were all out and about, mingling around. Okay. And the residents of Lawson were the most um, ambulant. They're the ones that were, they were the furthest away, so they were the ones that walked around the most. All right. So after 23 March, what areas of the home did you understand that your mum um, was visiting, moving to? All of them. She would be visiting her friends in other wings. <clears throat> She went for her walks around, keeping trying to keep active. Eating in the dining room? Um, yes, to a degree. She was a bit fussy with her food. So she basically was having food that we would supply. So she, you know, would have toast with the morning breakfast. For lunch, she usually had salmon on crisp breads at dinner time either a toasty from the kitchen or she'd have pumpkin soup or some cake, which the staff would help her with, with the toasties and the toast in the morning. And Just, she lived for her cup of tea in the morning. Okay. Did, did she have tea making facilities in her room? No. Did she have cups in her room or mugs? Yes, yes. she used her own cup to get tea and coffee. If she wanted water, um, was she able, for example, to go to the bathroom and use a tap there? She would fill a cup up because they were, at that stage they'd started giving them bottled water and she couldn't manage to open the lid. And unfortunately, there wasn't anyone available to open the lid for her. So she was having the water from the bathroom sink. And she was mobile enough to be able to get to the bar to the bathroom, turn on the tap, fill up a cap, and take it back to her furniture in the in the room. <clears throat> you, 
You mentioned that you'd bring food to her. Was there a fridge in her room? Yes. So was that the case before the lockdown occurred that you would bring items of food that she liked and she'd keep them in her room? Yes. And my sister Joyce would supply her with all the drinks and chocolates that she liked. <laughs> Did that continue after the lockdown? No, we weren't allowed to take anything to Newmarch. All right. When when did that stop? When the lockdown occurred. Twenty three March. Yeah. Now your mother's birthday fell on the sixth of April, two thousand and twenty, right? It was ninety three. All right. And did you make a request at that time? Um, to take your mother out of the home right. on her birthday. Yes. Um, and what happened? Um, it was refused. If we could take her out, but if she then returned, she would have to isolate in her room for 14 days. That's what you were told? Yes. And who told you that? Linda Burns told my sister Alison, who worked there. Okay. And so a family decision was made not to take your mum out, is that right? That's right. To avoid that isolation period. Thought that would be horrific for her. Um, did you have a window visit with her though around that time? Yes, we had a window visit. It wasn't at her room. It was um, at the main entrance, just to the left of where you enter. There is a large conference room and mum was wheeled in there and she was given a phone. The nurse brought the phone out to us and we were able to talk to her over the phone. We took presents, which um, they took in for her. Right. Now, we've heard evidence, and we'll hear further evidence about window visits that occurred where families of residents would go up to the window, potentially of the room of the loved one, and be able to communicate through a window. That's not the type of visit you're talking about on this occasion. No, we were not aware that you could do that. We were told that they were in lockdown, so no visitors. Right. Yeah. So this was just a, a particular Request. visit that was arranged because of the birthday. And you've explained that that happened in another part of the home at the... Yeah, at the front end. At the main entrance. Now, just moving forward to the period after 11 April, when you were notified about a full lockdown at Newmarch, um, you spoke to your mother on the 12th of April, correct? Mm -hmm. And did she complain about certain things? Yes, yeah, she said that in the dining room um, there was a man coughing over lunch and um, we sort of said, don't go near him. Um, and she would help clean up the lunch at that stage, so we asked her not to do that. To stop doing the cleaning up. Your evidence earlier was that she understood that COVID, uh, that there was a COVID outbreak. Yeah. Um, so her, when she raised concerns about coughing, was that in the context of COVID? Well, it, was there anybody sick in there, you know, and she's thinking, oh, yeah, well, so-and-so, he was coughing a lot over lunch. Right. Um, you continued to have telephone contact with her. Mm -hmm. And can I ask you, was this the main form of communication that you had? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, with um, New March full stop in the course of this episode, that is phone contact with your mother. Yes. She would tell us what was going on. Um, in the course of those conversations, did she tell you that she was experiencing loneliness? Oh, she was extremely lonely and depressed. She saw no one, she had no, you know, nothing. <laughs> you mentioned before that water was delivered and 
um, she wasn't able to open right. the lids of the bottles of water. Um, what, what further did she tell you about that? Well, she did ask um, a gentleman to open it for him, for her, and he said that he couldn't. He, he wasn't allowed to touch anything in the room and for to her to ring the bell. And did no she? No one ever came. So sorry. She did ring the bell, did she tell you? And she told you no one would come when she rang the bell. Was that just something she said once about bells not being oh, responded yeah. to, or did she raise that more than once? She mentioned it more than once. Um, did you try and contact the facility? Oh, yeah. And how did you try and do that? I was ringing every phone number that we had for Newmarch. And what would happen when you would call? Either it would just go beep, 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 or it would just ring out. There was never an answering machine facility that I ever was able to contact. Mm. Um, I'm asking you a general question now, but in this period, from let's say 11 April mm -hmm. um, until your mother's passing. If you could estimate what percentage of phone calls that you tried to put through to Newmarch House were successfully were successful calls um, in the sense that they were answered? I would say a very low percentage because when mum was quite sick, I would get the one call from the RN in the morning from the comms that was, but I wouldn't get a second one. And I would just sit pressing redial on my phone, like desperate to find out how she was because we knew how sick she was and she couldn't answer the phone. So, and unfortunately, if there was a return call, it was no caller ID. And if I missed it, I couldn't, I was back just pressing redial again. Now, in the period 17th through to the 19th mm -hmm. um, of April, um, you did receive calls from registered nurses? I did, yes. Did you know any of the nurses? No, but they usually would introduce themselves. I had a phone call from someone that had come from St Vincent's and, you know, she told me she's going to be looking after mum. And, you know, we were so relieved to have someone qualified, competent, trained that would be following through. Never heard from her again. I had someone from Aspen also ring and tell us that they would be looking after mum. We'd be receiving two phone calls a day. I don't think I ever spoke to her again. I had one evening I had someone ring from Baptist Care who actually knew my sister, Alison, who had worked with her at another facility and she said, you know, that she'd be there and she'd make sure mum was okay. Never heard from her again. So usually they were, until they got that comms team set up it, and I got a designated person, I, I don't know who, who I was talking to half the time, just right. that they were a registered nurse and they were updating me on mum's condition. I see. Comms team short for communications yes. team, I take it. Do you remember when it was, when you think it was that you started receiving regular calls from a designated nurse? Well, it was when they started the comms team, which occurred after um, complaints that we had made, a phone call to that we had with Grant Millard and Melissa McIntosh, who was our local member, um, Louise Payne, another mum or parent, sorry, daughter, and myself. And, you know, they said about setting up a comms team, a designated nurses that, you know, everybody would be allocated one, any positive patients would get two calls a day, and the negative people that were in there would get one. Can I just ask you to focus on the date? When, when it was that you think that that started? What's your... I should write, I should have written that down.
I would say it was late April. Late April. But, you know, I've tried very hard to forget all of this and now it's... That's all right. It's, it's not a memory test as far as dates is concerned. It's, I was just after your best impression. So up to that period in late April... Um, it was random. The experience was you're being contacted by different nurses when you're when you're contacted by nurses, mm -hmm. and the the effect of your evidence is that there wasn't continuity of no. contact with particular nurses that changed. You know, and I note the time. Is, yes. is that a convenient point? It is. For a break. <clears throat> Watson, um, we're going to break for morning tea now, and then we'll continue with your evidence um, after that break. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll come back at twelve o'clock.
Mr Buchan. Thank you. I come now to 20 April. And is it the case that you telephoned your her mother at 1.45 in the afternoon? Correct. And did she tell you something then? She had not been delivered any food or tea all day. She asked, she rang the bell, someone came. She asked for lunch. She was told it was too late for lunch. Um, she wanted a sandwich. She'd run out of all her food that, you know, she had stashed everywhere, biscuits and so forth. And then um, she was given a sandwich later in the day. I then started ringing New March frantically, of course. I couldn't contact with anybody at all. I sent, I got onto mum later that day and she said that that evening that someone had given her a sandwich. All right, so there were, there was more than one phone call with Alice on the 20th. Yes. Told at about 1.45 she hadn't been delivered any food that day at all. You managed to speak to her um, later that evening, is that correct? And um, she told you at that time that she'd been provided with a sandwich. I even tried ringing, I had the mobile number of the manager at the time, Leanne. Yes. And left a message on her mobile. I emailed her as well that evening. And I got a response from Leanne the next day. You, did you also send an email to Leanne um, sending out your concerns? Can I ask that a document be put up? It's volume 22, uh, tab 29, at page 179. Um, just have a look at that document. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. It's an email to Leanne, L E A N N Hinton, um, and it's from you, mm -hmm. dated 20 April at 3.10 in the afternoon, or thereabouts. And you see in the second paragraph, you say, Well, I understand what you're all going through and how difficult things are with the COVID 19 crisis. In your facility, there are basic needs that need to be met. Mm -hmm. And then in the next paragraph, you say, firstly, I spoke to my mum at 2.35 today. She was still waiting for her lunch. She had asked for a cheese toasty. I'm sorry, but this is not acceptable under any circumstance. Whilst some would keep ringing the buzzer, unfortunately, my mum is not one to do that. Due to her diagnosis, she is losing weight and missing a meal is not okay. Um, in terms of losing weight there, what was, what were the circumstances that led you to put that part of the, put that in your email? Because we knew that if, you know, she did get the virus, she would need all of her strength and, and be, her health be maintained as well as it could be, so that if she did get sick, she had some reserves to fight it. Was there something in particular that led you to write, she is losing weight? Because of her um, undiagnosed cancer, bowel cancer. You're worried about weight loss? Yes. Uh, you then go on to say that you're concerned for her mental and physical well-being in the next paragraph. And you raise particular concerns about being confined to her room. Um, and in effect, what you're referring to there is whether she could be taken out to the courtyard just for a change of scene.
Now, you mentioned that you made some phone calls to Newmarch House. Did those phone calls get through? I did have some success. I spoke, well, Leanne had replied to me the next day. I'm talking about on the 20th. Oh, no. Did you try and call Newmarch on the 20th? Oh, yes. I rang every number right. that I had. And what happened when you rang phone numbers? They just rang out. They rang out. The following day, Leanne did contact you. That's correct. And um, your recollection of the conversation is what? Uh, well, she, um, when I was describing my concerns and what was going on, her response was really. She didn't um, answer my questions. Her um, response was to offer me a FaceTime call to my mum, which I said, that's not what I'm ringing for. I want her looked after. I don't need a FaceTime call. She did say she would look into the food issue. After that phone call and turning to what happened on the 22nd of April, um, did you make a complaint to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission? I did. And do you remember how it was that you made that complaint? Was it by it was, phone or by email? It was or an online submission. Right. Do you also remember sending uh, Ms Hinton a further email on the 22nd of April? Oh God, I sent so many emails. I sent one to um, Anglicare's main office describing my concerns. Mm. I did follow up, I don't know if it was the main office or Leanne, to say that, you know, I was quite disturbed, upset that, you know, nothing Nothing was um, happening. I was still getting phone calls from my mum who was quite distressed. Um, can I ask that page, the same volume and tab, uh, volume 22, tab 29, page 187, be dis displayed? This is an email that's dated 22 April 2020 at 8.42 in the evening. You can see that it's to a, an Anglicare email address called Coronavirus Updates. And it's an email from you, clearly. All right, just have a look at that. Had a chance to look at that. Yeah, that's strongly a strongly worded email. Quite angry. Yes. One can just take that from the, the text. Um, you were concerned in that email that um, vulnerable um, residents had been left isolated and without basic care. Um, you were concerned about a loss of control at the facility. Yes. And you indicated that you had made a complaint to the commission. The regulator. Um, and finally, you indicated that you'd lost trust in the in the home in the home. I did. Um, you did receive a call on the twenty second of April from Melinda Burns, the manager. Is that right? Uh, in your statement. You use these words. She basically fobbed me off. Um, what do you mean by that? 
I, I think she was, um, she disregarded my concerns. She felt that what they were doing was the best that they could do. As for physio, she said nobody wanted to go into Newmarch. Mm. But, you know, nobody did. Can I just ask you, focusing on this point in time and focusing on your mother's situation, what were your main concerns that you held at that time? She was still COVID negative. So our main concern was maintaining her health, making sure her basic needs weren't being met, that she was being fed, she was getting cups of tea, she was having her medication, that she was being cared for, that if she rang the bell, someone would answer it. But they were short staffed. You also refer in your statement at paragraph 25 to um, Dr. Graydon, who was a GP who was looking after your mother at that time. That was a GP connection that had been organised through Newbarch House, is that right? No, well, he was one of the doctors that serviced that. that he was on a panel of GPs that. that he was chosen by us to be the fam his mum's GP. Right. Were you having contact with Dr. Graydon at this time? No. So when it says in your statement that Dr. Graydon wasn't able to log into eye care, is that something you've read or no, something you discussed I, with Dr. Graydon? Because I was so concerned about my mum, mm. um, I rang Dr. Graydon's um, office. Yes. I spoke to her, his secretary. Yes. And she was the one that told me that someone from Newmarch had rung him that day and that he had been locked out of the eye care program and that he didn't have any information about mum. And that was through his secretary. On this day, you turned up to Newmarch House. That's right. And there were other families present. Where were you physically? Out the front. On the roadside. Right. right directly out the front. And what was happening there at that time? Um, the media had then been involved. They were all there asking questions. Um, we saw it as an opportunity to share information with each other. If someone had found out something that we could share it with each other, we, we blindly thought that someone from inside would come out and talk to us and we could ask our questions and find out what was going on inside. We couldn't get into Newmarch. There was a security guard at the gate. So we basically were out the front. Why did you attend at that time? Because I was desperate to, for information about mum. We wanted to know what was going on. You know, at that stage, people were starting to pass away. We knew that there was critical shortages inside Newmarch. So, you know, was something that we had to do to look after our parents. You say in your statement, it was broadcast by the media that we were protesting, but this was not true. No. Um, can you just expand on that part of your statement, we protesting. please? We were there uh, begging for help, basically. Like, someone help us, someone do something. Mm. Um, what was your understanding as at 22 April, that time you turned up, about how many residents had passed away? Um, I, I don't recall the number, but I know that it was growing. And right. I know that the infection rate inside was growing in how, residents as well as staff. How did you know that? Um, it was reported on the news. Did anyone from Anglicare come out no. that afternoon? I've assumed it's afternoon. Was it afternoon that you were there? Four o'clock in the afternoon. Did anyone from Anglicare come out to speak to you? Um, you said there was a security guard there. Um, what role was he playing? Um, to make sure no one got inside. Right. So the family just milled around in that area? Is that what occurred? Um, was any attempt made to send a message through to say that you wanted to speak to people inside? I think it was pretty obvious we were all there. Right. 
How many people do you think were there? Um, maybe about 15. Was that the only time no, we went that occurred? We went back every day. So from the 20, from 22 April? Mm -hmm. Was there a particular time when families would go? Four. Four o'clock. We also started a Facebook, Facebook group, um, Friends and Family of Newmarch. And again, that was basically so that we could share information and ask questions. Somebody else might know the answer of our you know, concerns. But the following day, um, there was a webinar mm -hmm. or event that was organised by Anglicare. That's on the 23rd of April, correct? Yes. And at that webinar, um, the speakers included um, the Aged Care Commissioner, Ms Anderson, uh, Dr. Branley was there, you're saying your statement. Um, I take it uh, Mr. Millard, the CEO of Anglicare, participated. Is that right? That's correct. There was an advocate for elderly people also involved. Amen, yes. Right. Um, you were provided with some information, I take it, during that webinar. Yes. You understand that there's a, a transcript of the webinar in the brief of evidence. That's right. And just for the record, that's volume 22 at tab 27. Do you see at the end of the paragraph 26 of your statement, it says, I wanted, oh, sorry, I voiced my concerns. It should have said, I couldn't voice my concern. I thought it was going to be an interactive meeting, but it was just an information session. I see. Did you did you speak during the webinar? At, oh, under my breath at home. <laughs> right. Did you have opportunity, though, to speak in the event itself? In other words, join in the webinar? Did you come out of that event having a better understanding of what was happening to your mother? My... I watched every Zoom meeting that we had, so they do sort of gel together. My memory of that meeting was of Janet Anderson telling us that there were no profound failures at Newmarch. That, so that heightened my anxiety. So a lot of stuff just... I did hear Dr Branley talk about managing um, hospital in the home and what they could do and what they would do. Um, there was information given about bringing in extra people and how Anglicare with the you know, extra precautions and so forth that they would do to manage the, like their risk assessments as far as COVID mm. and infection control. Do you remember there being any specific information given about particular patients during or residents no. during that event? It was, it was general information provided yes. um, about what was happening at the facility. That's right. Now, the following day, 24 April of 2020, um, your mother was diagnosed with COVID-19. Yes. Or tested positive for COVID-19. Um, how did you find out? An RN rang me at around 7.30 on Friday, that Friday morning. What were you told? That she had tested positive and um, I was told that an infectious disease physician would ring me from Nepean Hospital to explain what was going to happen, what the symptoms were, what the treatment, the management would be. Did that occur? Did you receive that day a call from infectious an infectious diseases expert to discuss your mother's condition? No, that occurred on the 30th, a week later.
did you try and contact your mother after finding out this piece of information? I, of course, as soon as I got the information that be that I was told that I immediately let my family know. Yes. It just happened that at about ten fifteen, my sister rang because my mum had rung her extremely distressed because um, no, she had had nothing, no tea, no medication, no breakfast, and she. <laughs> When before, when she said um, that no one had answered her, her calls, I said, "Look, just open the door and stick your head out and yell, and they'll come running." Well, she did that day, and when she opened the door, there was a sign on her door and the trolley with all the PPE in front. So she rang my sister, extremely distressed, saying, "Why is that there? I'm not sick. I haven't got the virus." So then Joyce tried to calm her down. She let me know and I rang probably for a good hour trying to get through to someone at Newmarch to go and, you know, find out what's going on. Um, someone eventually did answer the phone. I asked them if um, she could have a pastoral care worker with her when she was given the news because I knew that, you know, she she was very religious, her faith was very important to her and that she would want someone with her to pray. So um, then I think I ended up ringing mum later and I actually had to tell her that she had the virus and and she just kept saying, but I'm not sick, I'm not sick. And she was extremely distressed. She got her medications, because I've, I've documented it, yes. um, at quarter to one that day. So is, it, is this the case that your mother um, at some point in the day had not been told that she had tested COVID positive? No. She saw outside her room a trolley with PPE equipment on it Perfect. Yes, and that caused her concern yeah. that upset her because she... and there was a notice on her door right she didn't understand why those items were in place um, because she hadn't been told no. that she was COVID positive and ultimately, you had to break it to her yes. that that was the case. Um, and in the course of conversations, either with your sister and you in the day, your mother had also complained that she hadn't received food or tea or medications. That was the original reason that she rang my sister. Right. When you were first informed that your mother was co had tested COVID positive, mm -hmm. was that a RN calling you? Yes, an RN rang me. Not you calling New March to find out what was happening. No, no, I was wrong. Okay. Can I just move forward to the 26th of April? Mm -hmm. um, was there an attempt to have a WhatsApp video call with your mum? Yes. So at this stage, you weren't attending for window visits with your mum? No. And just tell me, why is that? Why weren't you holding window visits with her at this point in time? We weren't allowed in. And when you say you weren't allowed in, from what point? From the main gate out the front? Yes. They were in lockdown. What happened with the 
video call? Well, my mum was 93. <laughs> um, the smartphones are a very new invention for someone. Yep. But, you know, someone helped to do it and we were quite appreciative that, you know, that attempt had been made because we actually got to see her rather than just speak to her on the phone. And did that become a regular form of communication after that or...? It was sporadic. Sporadic. How did your mother appear on the 26th of April when you saw her? Um, yeah, she, she looked all right. She, yeah, she was happy to be able to see us. Um, later that day, did the family receive another call from a, from a nurse? Yes. And do you remember who received that call? Myself. You did. And what were you told? That she was okay. She was doing all right. Um, I was concerned about weight loss due to the lack of food. Mm. Um, I asked for her to be weighed. Um, she was, I was worried about her asthma. She was quite reliant on her nebulizer. So I wanted to double check that she was still getting Ventolin virus spacer or somehow. Did your mother then later call your sister Joyce? Yes. And you spoke with Joyce about that telephone call? She was extremely upset, extremely, extremely upset. So I tried calling Newmarch to see if I could find someone that could just go in and be with her for a short time to calm her down. You mentioned before that your mother was an anxious person. Yes. Um, and did you have any success in obtaining that assistance? No. Um, in response to um, your concerns about weight loss, did you specifically ask that a food chart be commenced for, for your mother? No, when they rang and said that she would, that she did lose a few kilos, that they would commence a food chart. Right. Which I thought was a good idea. Okay. On the 28th of April, mm -hmm. um, you received another phone call from a registered nurse. Yes. And um, were you told that your mother had lost a few kilos? Yes. Is that this? Just in turn, was that said to you more than once? Because you, you, you mentioned a moment ago an earlier call where you were told that that resulted in the food chart being implemented. Well, they have obviously started that between my ask for the weight to be recorded and then telling me that they'd already put in place a food chart. Right. Um, and is it the case you could hear your mother coughing in the background? And did you hear your mother say something? Yes, yeah, she said, don't worry, it's my asthma. The asthma. And you were concerned, were you, about whether the cough was asthma or COVID? Yes. And at that time, were you provided with any information about that? I was still waiting for the call from the infectious disease doctor at Nepean. Right. And I had asked, each time I spoke to an RN there, I said, I still haven't had that call. Okay. Um, is it also the case on this day that family members who are upset wrote an email to Mr Millard? That's correct. Uh, which was copied to politicians and government departments Everybody and things of that kind. Um, why was that email sent? Because we, we weren't getting answers. We were so concerned about what was happening inside Newmarch, um, the communication, care, lack of care. We just 
We just wanted answers. We were desperate. At paragraph 34 of your statement, you referred to receiving a call, a telephone call from um, Mr. Millard. Correct. And just explain what happened during that call. Um, he um, obviously had read our letter. He wanted to know what my concerns were. I told him about mum getting a frozen cheese sandwich for lunch. I told him that mum was doing her washing in her bathroom sink and trying to dry it in her room. Uh, what else did you? He, um, asked, he then asked, you know, are you getting window visits? And I replied, no. He asked if the GPs were attending, I said no. Uh, so video calls aren't happening. I said no. Um, he asked who had organised for mum to go outside and have a walk. I told him it was Dr Branley that had organised that. Um, he, he seemed surprised and shocked and I sort of was a bit annoyed and that I ended up saying to him, why are you asking me these questions? You should know the answer to these. And he said that he would um, look into it. How did you know about Dr. Brandley um, permitting your mother to have a we walk outside? outside? At the fence, at our meeting. That was on the 29th of April, was it, or a different date? It was on the 29th. And so you're outside, and what could you see? Well, someone said to my sister and myself, isn't that your mum? And we ran to the fence and we could see her outside and um, up near the building with um, some nurses and they put her on the phone and we were able to talk to her. I see. And who did she tell you that Dr Bradley had seen her? Yes. And allowed her to walk and then go for a walk? In the sun. Yes. In the sun. They referred to it as sunlight therapy. Right. How far away was your mother physically from you when you saw her on that occasion? On, well, she was inside at the building and we were outside on the roadside on the other side. Like there was two fences, it was a distance. Right. I'm not very good at distances. Okay. So to have a conversation with her, you had to have that over the phone. Yeah, but we did yell out to her. You did yell out to her. How did she look? Oh, well, she was pleased to be outside, you know, looking at the gardens, having a walk. She was talking to a lovely girl, she said. She was, yeah, feeling a little bit more upbeat. At that stage, was she lucid in oh, the conversation? Yes. Yes, yes. Any concerns about her lucidity no, no. at that time? Um, how did she look in terms of strength or frailty? Um, she did look frailer and that she had lost some weight, yes. But she was still with a walker and she was still able to, you know, walk around. Now, could we come to the 30th of April? On that day, um, did you have a conversation with a doctor about the advanced care plan? Correct, yes. That was in place. Um, and your recollection is that it was Dr Kakat that you spoke to on this occasion. You wrote in your statement Dr Kakat, but you've heard enough evidence to know it's likely to be Dr Kakat. Um, how long did you speak for? Oh, probably a good five minutes. Um, were there other doctors on the phone? No, it was just him. To my knowledge, it was just him. Do you remember if it was a telephone call or a video call? No, it was it was a phone call. You received it on your on, my mobile. on your mobile phone. 
So you were speaking, Dr Kakat was speaking. Is there anyone else from your family that you remember no, being no, involved in the call? I've seen him. All right. And what do you recall of that conversation? Well, Ms. he um, explained um, the disease of COVID and how it um, manifests and the you know signs as they move through um, treatment. Um, he explained to me that in the elderly, the um, mortality rate was about 50%. He said that there was only a five to 10% chance of recovery if mum ever needed to be ventilated, which would need to be done in hospital. So I, I agreed with him that um, mum didn't want to be ventilated if that was the only course of action. So definitely no hospital for ventilation. Okay. And of course he reinforced that everything that could be done for mum, that could be done at Nepean, could be done at Newmarch House, apart from ventilation. So did you come out of the, that call with an understanding that um, your mother would be able to be provided with every treatment Absolutely. in Newmarch House up to, but not including mechanical ventilation. You agreed with the doctor's advice that if things got so bad that um, mechanical ventilation was required, you didn't want your mother to be transferred to hospital for that procedure. Did you understand that your mother was to receive supportive care, supportive therapy? Um, the symptom, her symptoms as they manifested would have been treated. Right. Was there any discussion about the particular forms of treatment that would be provided um, to I, treat her symptoms? I don't recall that he went into a nitty gritty treatments. He just said that, you know, they would treat the symptoms as they occurred. Was there any discussion about oxygen, for example? No. Was there any discussion about fluids? No. Any discussion about antibiotics? No. I ask you to um, put up tab eight of this volume, page one. You had um, previously been involved in an advanced care plan for your mother, is that right? Yes. So if you have a look at this document, you can see that your mother's name is at the top there, handwritten. Then underneath that, under the words, all my representative named below, who has been informed of my wishes, values and belief, and your name is written there. Now, if you turn over the, to the next page of the records that we have, page two, you'll see it goes on to a different document altogether, which is actually dated 15 May 2020. You see that at the top there? Um, Usually there's a second page to the advanced care plan. If you could just go back to page one, please. There's a second page uh, which has signature of the person who's made the plan as well as um, a date that's missing from the records. Do you have a recollection of seeing this document, first of all? Um, yes, this would have been in 2019. Um, my mum was having some uh, heart problems. She was having a little bit of um, chest pain. She went to hospital twice for that. And I remember I asked my sister who worked there, has mum got an advanced care plan? And she checked and she didn't. So we thought it was probably a good idea if we did one. 
Mm -hmm. So that's when that was done. All right. I assume that as someone who worked in nursing, you understood what an advanced care plan involved at a general level. It says at the very top of the document, it is important that you, your family and your doctor are always involved in decisions that affect your care at the end of your life. Considering the extent of treatment and intervention you would wish for at this time gives you and your family peace of mind for the future. And it goes on about how important it is that wishes are discussed with your loved ones, your doctor, those caring for you. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Now, just turning down to the um, the options, it's headed with those words: request the following in the event of acute illness, injury, or advanced dementia. So your there was no sign of dementia, was there, in your mother? Um, so I assume this document was directed to the first of those two categories, either acute injury or, sorry, acute illness or injury. Yes. All right. So the first item concerns cardiopulmonary resuscitation, um, and what was ticked there was, I do not want cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Correct. Do, do, you, do you recall being with your mother when this? document was completed? My mother didn't want anything to do with this kind of stuff. Um, we knew what her wishes were, um, but she definitely did not want to be resuscitated. Right. So is it your... I did this by myself. You did this by yourself? My you, sisters knew, of course. Just looking at the handwriting, do you think you filled out the document? That's Mary Watson. That's my name. Is that your writing, though? or that Mary Watson is my writing. Alice Bacon is, I think that might be my sister's writing, but my name is Mary Watson, that's me. You've written that. Do you think you tick the boxes yourself on yeah. the form? The next um, section deals with artificial nutrition. Mm -hmm. I do not wish to be kept alive by being fed artificially. So you, you had discussed these issues with your mother yes. at some time. In completing this document, you felt you had a good understanding of what level of care she desired in the event of an acute illness. Is that right? The next um, section says this, I do, I do want to receive oral antibiotics. I understand intravenous administration of antibiotics may require transfer to hospital. Yes. So by that item, you're indicating that if a particular treatment was indicated, namely antibiotics, you wanted that to occur even if it meant transfer to hospital. Yes. Then you look at the next section, which says hospital transfer. You haven't ticked the box, I do want to be transferred to hospital if medically indicated. Instead, the box is ticked, I do not wish to be transferred to hospital except to maintain comfort. I prefer to remain in my place of residence following a palliative care plan, the priority being my comfort and dignity. That's the option that you chose there. Can I just ask you, what do you what did you understand was the effect Mum, of ticking that box? Mum did not want to be transferred to hospital in the event that it was an end of life event. So if she had a stroke or was in a coma or had a cardiac arrest or some massive um, injury that, you know, there was no, no return. She wanted to stay at Newmarch and die in her own bed. Right. That, that was what her wishes were. So if things came to the point where you're making end of life decisions, and in particular, um, the commencement of palliative care, yes. you wanted that, or your mother wanted that to happen in the home, if possible. If it were the case um, that your 
that there were um, interventions in avail available in a hospital setting that would provide, for example, a better standard of supportive care. What do you understand the wishes were in that context? She would have gone to hospital. She went to hospital in January for a blockage in her common bile duct. And mum always said, oh, no hospital, no hospital. But, you know, she was sick. Mum, you need to go to hospital. Yes, I do. And off she went. You're relating the sort of conversation you'd have with your mother. Absolutely. In the context of palliative care, end of life decisions, yeah. if it were the case that palliative care um, <clears throat> wasn't able to be provided at the home adequately, what would the wishes have been in that circumstance? Well, well, that... to that. that's, um, that's a little bit speculative hmm. in the sense that unless that conversation's been had, and there's no evidence of that, then the witness is being asked to guess. Yes, all right, uh, Mr. Buchan. It's the effect of your evidence that you would speak to your mother um, about particular options as and when the circumstance arose. Um, and you gave an example of that type of conversation. You're sick, you need to go to hospital, and your mother would tend to agree if that was what was said. Yes. At this time, and I'm talking about now end of April 2020, when you have that telephone conversation with Dr Kekar, had you had a discussion with your mother about these particular choices at around that time? No. no. You filled out this form at an earlier point in time, 2019, obviously before COVID had commenced. It wasn't in contemplation at that time. When you filled out that form, did you put down responses that you believed reflected your mother's thinking about her wishes? Absolutely. And was that informed by conversations you'd had with your mother about her health? And the rest of the family, yes. And with the rest of the family as well. You've indicated that in the event that it matters progress to an end of life point, um, so that all that was going to be dis dispensed was palliative care, that your mother's wish was to stay in the home if possible. Yes. Do you see that last option that you've ticked? I do not wish to be transferred to hospital except to maintain comfort. Did those words except to maintain comfort have any significance for you when you ticked that option? Well, we took that to mean is comfort, meaning that there was nothing, that, that what was needed couldn't be provided at Newmarch. Right. So if, if they couldn't provide the drugs or the medication and mum had to be moved, well then yes, we she would have accepted that and she would have said, what do you think? But after the phone call on the 30th of April and other information that you've been provided along the way, is it, was it your understanding that your mother would be receiving that level of care at Newmarch Home short of mechanical ventilation in an ICU unit? That's correct. Every, absolutely everything that would be done at Nepean Hospital would be done at Newmarch except for ventilation.
Now, your mother was moved from her room on the 3rd of May, correct? Correct. She was moved to room C30. Do you understand why it was she was moved? Um, that's when they were putting all the positives together. They were separating because prior to that they were all over the place. All right. Well, did you have a conversation with your mother before she was moved or did you speak to her about it after the event? No, we talked to her when we went for a window visit that day in the afternoon and she was already across. So she was moved without you having had the opportunity to speak to her about the move? but had spoke to someone at Newmarch. Right. And that did that upset her, the move? Horrendously. It was her friend's room. All right. We don't need to name the friend, it but... It was her friend's room. Um, was your mother aware at the time that she moved that the friend had passed away? Did she become aware by virtue of the room that her friend had passed away? Well, she couldn't understand why she would be there if she was still here. Right. Did you have a conversation with her about this situation? We, I, I just said, oh, maybe she's in hospital because, you know, we were outside the window. She was inside, so there was no, we weren't able to be, to comfort her. So we just sort of, oh, maybe she's just in hospital or maybe they've had to move her as well. I hate it here. I don't want to be in here. Did she? Did you know at that time what had happened to her friend? Yes. You knew she had passed away. You received a call the following day from Dr. Sharma. Yes. Um, had you spoken to her before this, that date? That was the first call. That's the first call from Dr. Sharma. She was a geriatrician. Did you understand that? Yes. And part of the VAX team, as they call themselves. Yes. And she spoke to you about the fact that your mum was COVID positive. That was confirmed. Um, and it says in your statement, she spoke to you about the possibility of how sick mum may be. Yes. Can you just expand on what you were actually well, told? She, she described the process of the virus, how it starts, what what happens. Um, I'm pretty sure she discussed treatment at that stage, but at that time, Mum was still pretty stable, as you say. Do you remember any specifics about what she told you about the forms of treatment that would be given? No, because I believe that occurred on the 6th of May. All right. Um, well, let's move to the 6th of May. Your, your, your statement deals with some notes that you saw in respect of the 5th of May, right? Yes. Um, but that is, you've explained the circumstance by which you came to yes. inspect the clinical and progress notes in June. Mm -hmm. um, moving then to the 6th of May, you received a follow-up phone call from Dr Sharma. Yes. Right? Um, and what did she tell you? That she confirmed that mum actually did have the virus because we weren't sure still, oh, it's my asthma. So, you know, we really wanted clarification. Is she suffering from the virus or not? Yes. She um, explained what the treatment would be. Um, she mentioned morphine and I think she heard my in my voice and she assured me that it wasn't, what I was thinking, it was that they found that giving a small dose of morphine actually helped um, with her breathing. So just to stop you there, because the transcript won't pick up that sound you made, but you said just she heard the, it was like a, a light gasp sound. Yeah. They were going to give her morphine, which to me is, you know, what you do when you finished. Right. So you thought when she said morphine, yeah. final moments, or... or final stage, I should say, and then that was corrected. Is that what happened? Very much so. And, and Dr Sharma reassured you that this was a small amount of morphine that would be given for what purpose? Um, it would help her breathing. It would help her lungs. And what else did she tell you? She said that they get 
very sick for three days and then they wake up or they don't. I just thought, okay, got three days, okay. Right. She also said that, that she would have some oxygen and I believe at that stage they were also going to start her on some antibiotics and not so much for COVID because that was the virus, but um, just in case of any secondary infections that may occur. I see. And were you content with that form of treatment being dispensed? Yeah, because that's what the treatment, that was the only treatment, to my knowledge, that was being offered at that time. Right. Um, you, later that night, received a call from a, a nurse. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And what did she tell you? She asked me if I knew that Mum had a pressure sore. Do you remember the name of the nurse? No. You take a note of it anyway. No. All right. Was this just a... Was this a response to a call that you had made or was this a call out of the blue? It was an evening call to let me know how Mum was progressing. Right. Do you recall whether, I mean, at times you've been able to remember that a nurse was with Aspen, a nurse was from yeah. Baptist Care or from St Vincent's. Any memory about where this nurse no, um, came from? Okay. In any event, she asked you about um, whether you knew about a pressure sore which I did not. You hadn't heard anything about that up to then? No, not at all. And what, did she tell you anything further about that? She said that she had done an incident report, which would be in her files, obviously. And... Um, Have you ever seen an incident report in relation to a pressure uh, sore? And I looked and I requested it and I was told if it's not there, it's not here. W when did you request it? Um, afterwards, when I was going through reading my mum's notes. Okay. Just before we, almost at lunchtime, just before we leave this topic, did you subsequently receive, um, bear with me for a moment. some property belonging to your mother yes, was returned to you after she passed away. Yes. And did that include a mobile telephone, yes. a Samsung phone? Yes. Um, you've spoken about your mother using the landline. Did she use the mobile telephone? Not without assistance. So, so when, for example, you saw her out in the garden having the, the sunlight therapy walk, and you said you spoke to her on the phone. Was that on her mobile phone you would have spoken to her? So she was able to use it if someone assisted her. Yes. Otherwise, she used the landline with the, the pictorial buttons on it. When that telephone was returned, uh, did it contain some photographs? It did. And did those photographs include some photographs of a pressure saw? Yes, there was two photos. On, on the, your mother's rear side? Um, do you know who took those photos? No. Do you think your mother was capable of taking those photos? No. Is it your assumption that someone inside Newmarch House took those photos? Yes. On your mother's phone? Yes. And did you provide those photos to the police? Yes. As part of this coronial investigation? And you prepared a supplementary statement that described how you found those photos? And that statement is found at tab five of the um, volume 19 of the brief of evidence. You understand that? Ms Watson, I'm not going to display those photos because of their, their nature. You understand that, but you understand those photos are in evidence in the inquest. Your Honour, is that a convenient time for the lunch break? Um, Ms Watson, we're going to, to break for lunch now. Um, we'll continue with the evidence when we come back, and that will be at two o'clock.
Thanks, Mr. Buchan. Thank you, Your Honour. <clears throat> Ms. Watson, one matter that I accidentally passed over. Um, when I was asking you earlier about the 29th of April and your um, telephone call with Grant Millard, mm -hmm. which you described, um, one of the matters that he asked you about was whether you were getting window visits. Um, did you receive a call soon after that phone call on that subject? Yes. Um, and that was to organise window visits for you. And did you commence then visiting um, your mother through these window visits? We did. We certainly did. I went that day and they organised a booking system where we could go online and book visits and we were escorted to our mum's window. A couple of times there was outside visits, but it was mostly at the window. And I think, I think it was a 15 minute time limit because there were so many people that wanted to get in and see their loved ones. So we booked as much as we could. From 29 April onwards, how often were you visiting your Every mother? Day. Every day? And was it a situation where you would sit outside the window of her room? Yes. Um, was the window open? It was closed. So how could you communicate? Phone. Telephone? Couldn't hear each other talk through the window? Um, no, we would have had to shout. It was easier to use the phone. So you, you could see her and she would have a telephone and you'd call the, and you'd speak that way? Now, can we come back to um, the 6th of May? You've given evidence about um, being told by an RN, a registered nurse, um, or asked if you knew whether your mother had a pressure, sh a pressure sore on her buttock. Yes. Um, you gave evidence that at a later point in time, you retrieved your mother's mobile telephone, and on that telephone were photos of a pressure sore in that area. That's correct. I take it you didn't ask for those photos to be taken. No. Did you know the photos were being taken? You discovered that afterwards when you received the phone. Is that right? Um, the next, immediately after paragraph 39, which deals with that conversation about the pressure sore, Um, paragraph 40 says this, when we spoke to mum, all mum ever told us was, don't worry, I'm all right. Did you ask her about the pressure sores? Uh, I don't recall. I, I don't recall. You've got a sore bottom. Say that again, please. You've got a sore bottom. You told us that you've got a sore bottom. And she said yes. W was there any further discussion about that? On the 7th of May, um, you had a window visit with your mother, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And how did your mum appear at that time? She looked quite ill. In what way? Pale, breathless, lethargic. Right. Also on that day, did you participate in a video group call with some doctors? Yes. Was that before or after the video call? Oh, sorry, before or after the window visit? It was. The video call was during the day while I was at work. The visit was after work. I see. Now, do you remember participating in that video conference on the 7th of May? you recall was present? Um, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, that there were some people at Nepean 
part of it, and the rest were in my mum's room, and I was at work. I see. So people were joining in from different locations. Uh, do you remember who was with your mother physically? Uh, it was a young doctor, an RN. Right. Do you recall their names or not? It could have. I cannot swear to it, but I think it was Dr. Michael. Dr. Michael. And what about at the? I think it could have. The been. other end of the video conference, so not your mother's room now, the other location. Who was I think present it might there? Have been Dr. Kakat. Kakat. Yes. All right. Uh, what about Dr. Kathira San? I don't recall having a conversation with her. Right. But you do recall that you spoke with that doctor at various points in time? Yes, we she called was, her Dr J. You called her Dr J. She was a palliative care yes. specialist. <clears throat> what do you remember about that video call? They wanted to talk about Mum's advanced care plan. Um, they then again discussed hospital in the home and how absolutely everything that was required to keep mum well, healthy, um, treated could be done at Newmarch, except for mentally, ventilation. Do you recall who was leading the conversation for the, for the doctors on the call? I think it was Dr Michael. Was that the doctor who was present with her? <clears throat> and what was the position? Did you speak on the call? Oh, yeah. Did you, was your mother engaging in the process at all? She was sitting in the room. <laughs> she was in the room. She was seated in a chair, was she? In the chair. Um, did she talk at all? No, but when we were talking about no hospital for ventilation. She nodded her head and the doctor told me your mum's nodding her head no. Okay. <clears throat> Was there any other input from your direct input from your mother during that conference? No. Now, insofar as um, the clinicians were indicating that your mother would receive care um, and all forms of treatment up to ventilation, mechanical ventilation, what was your position in response to that? That was fine. We were assured and believed that absolutely everything that mum would need would be provided at Newmarch. All right. Was there anything else that you were told that influenced your thinking about this? Well, they'd already discussed the mortality rate and the risk that there was such a 5 to 10 per cent chance of success for incubation and mm. you know, she was 93 and we didn't want to have to put her through that kind of treatment at that stage. Um, in your statement of paragraph 41, mm -hmm. you say this, they really pushed and kept talking about mum not going to hospital. That's right. What do you mean by pushed? Well, he had his laptop and he kept saying, so no hospital, no hospital. And I ended up sort of, I think I sort of just laughed and said, well, if she falls and hurts herself or breaks a hip, of course we wanted to go to hospital. I was talking about ventilation, nothing else. Do you remember who it was who said to you it those? Was the young doctor. It was the younger doctor. Can I ask you this? In turn, you've indicated that you agreed with that overall treatment approach. Yes. And why was it that you agreed with that treatment approach? 
because we didn't we didn't want her to be ventilated if that was the only the last option mm. but we wanted her to be looked after as we were told that she would be at Newmarch as if she was in the Pean hospital mm. same treatment you were prepared to accept what the doctors were advising you of course I don't have a medical degree I trusted what they were telling me all right whose interest did you understand that they were they had at heart my mum's do no harm. There's a reference to something being said. This is in your statement at paragraph 41. Something being said about um, having to share a four bedroom ward in hospital. Can you, just doing the best you can, what's your memory of what was said in the conversation if in respect mum, of that matter? If mum went to hospital, she would be in a four bed ward and she would have to share a bathroom and we wouldn't be able to visit her. Do you remember why it was? Well, first of all, who said that? If you can't remember, you can't remember. I know Dr. Branley definitely said it to me when I've had I had discussions with him later on. You're not talking about on this occasion, though. No. Can you recall who said no. comments to that effect on this occasion? No, but it was said. Do you know why it was that that came up in the conversation? Because they were sort of insisting that mum should remain at Newmarch because she was in her own room, she was able to use her own bathroom, she slept in her own bed, she would be much more comfortable than in a strange environment with maybe strangers and sharing a bathroom. The following day, um, you received a call from a staff member indicating that your mother had declined um, and you were told you could visit her inside the home. Correct. Now, prior to this, had there been a visit inside the home no. after the complete lockdown was implemented. No. Right. So what did you understand was the situation given that you're being now permitted to come into the home for a visit? That it was end of life and we were going to say goodbye. All right. Did you in fact go on the 8th of May? Um, did you attend with family? Uh, my sister came in with me. Was that choice? Yes. All right. Well, you, I take it you're required to put on PPE? We signed the form yeah. at the front, had our temperatures taken. We were shown how to correctly put on the PPE and we were allowed to go inside for 15 minutes. We weren't allowed to touch mum. If we did, we would have had to have done two weeks isolation. Yes. So we just went in there for 15 minutes and cried, I think, mostly, and, and tried to speak to her. Could she speak at that stage? No. What was she doing? Um, she was in bed. Was she conscious? No, no. Did you take photos of her on this occasion? No. No, not on this occasion. Um, how long were you with her for? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Um, there was a, a nurse that you've singled out in your evidence named uh, Rachel. She was my contact. Right. And how did you find her? She was lovely. Yeah. They were all lovely. Then the following day, um, is it the case that you have the impression that your mother improved somewhat? Yeah. Um, what led you to that impression? Well, we saw her. This was a window visit again? Yes. Not an internal visit this time. And what was different? Well, she was awake. Right. Sitting in a chair. Were you able to speak to her? Yes. Ha on the phone again? Yes. That 
situation, looking through the, the glass. Do you remember anything about the conversation you had? I'm all right, don't worry. Right. Okay, and then the next day, sorry, she said something about her asthma again, did she? Um, the following day was the uh, 10th of May. Um, and again, you went for a window visit. Um, and how did she appear on that occasion? Um, she's sitting out in a chair. It was Mother's Day, so we had arranged like visits basically all day so that we were all getting to see her. We were able to take presents in three days prior so that she could have them in a room for Mother's Day. She was a bit breathless, but she definitely was much better than when we saw her on Friday. Right. She was given, um, and she had those presents, she had received those. You were able to talk to her. Was she lucid in the phone call? Yes. Right. Um, moving then to the 11th of May, did you receive a call from Dr Sharma? Yes. Um, had you spoken to Dr Sharma before on a one-on-one -on -one call? Um, previously about the diagnosis and when she was right. not well. So. You've referred to that phone call. Um, and what did Dr Sharma um, tell you? She was quite hopeful. She thought mum had turned the corner. Her um, condition had improved. So, you know, the three days of, of COVID had passed. She woke up. So we were all quite hopeful then that um, yeah, all would be well. At this point in time, had you spoken to Dr. Branley yet? Um, I think my sister and I ran into him one day in the driveway as we were walking, walking up. Um, he knew who my mum was. He uh, thought that she was um, doing pretty well. He was looking after her. He thought she was a pretty strong nut. It was a Sunday. Right. So you receive a call from uh, Dr Sharma on the 11th, who, in light of the improvements that your mother appeared to be making, um, was, it was an upbeat phone call. Very much so. Um, what you note in your statement is that you've observed in progress notes that your uh, mother was found on the floor but this was not considered to be a fall. Were you told anything about a fall no. by anyone? No. Were you told anything about your mother being found on the floor? No. That's something you observe later in notes. Then on the 12th, you received a call from your sister, correct? That's right. She had been to visit your mother, I take it, and she told you that um, what did she tell you about your mother? That she looked terrible at call at, again, and that was despite that I was receiving my phone calls from Rachel to say that her observations were in normal limits. Um, she slept during the night. Her O2, O2 saturations were fine and that, you know, stable. Did you visit your mum on the 12th? I would have went in the afternoon, of course. Right. Do you remember how she appeared to you at that time? Um, sick. Right. And in what way? Can you just expand um, on that? She had um, nausea, um, lethargic. She was quite dry. She was showing symptoms of, you know, how? licking her lips and you're thirsty, do you want a drink? And she would nod yes. Right. Was she able at that point to 
get herself into the bathroom unassisted and use the tap and fill up a cup and get herself water at that stage? No, she would not. And, and is that because she, she was weak? She was very weak, yes. Um, on that day, the 12th, seeing your mother in that state and Joyce making that phone call to you, um, did that lead to any attempts to contact Newmarch on the 12th of May? I'm quite sure I would have run Newmarch. Right. I haven't documented it, but um, in light of her not being well and me being worried, I would have rang. Okay. Do you remember having any phone calls with anyone at Newmarch about Again, that? I would have had the call from Rachel, the com nurse in the morning. Yes, yes, definitely. But what about after you saw her later heard. that day and saw that she had once again deteriorated? No recollection of that. When I received a phone call, I always had to then let my two sisters know. So I always had a log of when someone rang or I got told something because then I would forward something to them. Right. Do you have any note about any phone calls on the 12th? No. You did, however, have a phone call on the 13th. Yes. Is that right? And that was with Dr Sharma again, the geriatrician. Yes. And what do you remember from that phone call? She rang to say that Mum wasn't doing very well. Um, she didn't think it was COVID related. And I said, oh, do you think it's her bowel cancer? And um, she said she didn't know. She said she was going to order some blood tests. And I actually asked her if mum could have some fluids because she was showing signs of being dehydrated when we visited. She said that she could. And um, what else did she do? Yeah, well, that's what she ordered the blood tests. And did you ask just for fluids or any particular kind of fluids? I, IV fluids, not, I meant, you know, medical, not sips of water. Right. And at that stage, were you able to observe whether your mother was on IV fluids? No, because they weren't available. Right. Had you observed her on IV fluids at any time up to that point? No. No. <clears throat> So you asked for IV fluids and Dr Sharma told you that that could happen, but that they weren't available at that time, is that right? They weren't available. They were at, up the road at Nepean. Right. And was there any further discussion about that? Um, the next day. Well, that day. Um, anything further about when they would become available? Or well, when they like would that? become available, she would get them. Right. <clears throat> Now, did you visit your mother the following day? Um, That's the 14th of May. Yes. Did you also receive a call on that day at about 2.30 in the afternoon? Yes, I was on the way to Newmarch at that time, right. so I was in the car. That's answered the question I was going to ask, which is, what occurred first. So you received the, the phone call first. Who was that call from? Um, Dr. J. Right. Care doctor. Okay, that's Dr. Katheriason, the um, palliative care specialist. And what do you what do you remember from that phone call? Um, that she said mum had declined and it was time to think about her her comfort and that she didn't think that any treatment would be um, advised at that st at that time, and that we should be thinking of you know what's best for mum. Was anything said about fluids? No. In that call. No. What was your response to what Dr. Katheria Sun said? I I was upset, of course. She, I do remember. I she said it was too late for because it was too late for the bloods to be taken, and it was too late for the fluids, and that Mum wasn't going to make it. Right. When you went to, did you continue travelling to Newmarch? Um, 
Did you speak to any other doctor before seeing your mother? What had happened was, as I was on my way to Newmart, um, Joyce was already there at the window. As she left, she ran into Dr. Branley and she told Dr. Branley what I had just rung and told her. And he said that um, he was going to go straight away and see mum, which, which he did. Um, so who, who, who had that conversation with Dr. Branley? Joyce spoke Joyce to him face to face. Did you speak to Dr. Branley face to face? Um, a phone call. He, he rang me and I said, I'm here. Yes. And he said that he hadn't given up on mum. Yes. And he said that there was still a few things that he could do. Right. I asked him at that point that could mum have the fluids and could he, because he was going to be there taking antibody tests. Yep. And I said, well, can he please take the blood test while he's there? And he said he would. Okay. And he did, because as we went to the window, they were in the room doing that. You saw Dr. Brandley actually with your mother yes. through the window. Your mother was seated in her chair yes. at this time, is that right? Yes. Um, and were, were you told anything about her prognosis at this stage? Well, he said he hadn't given up on her, so that gave us hope. Right. And again, um, it was the three days. If, she, if we can get her through the next three days, there's the chance that she will make it through. Who said that? Dr. Brandley. That was Dr. Brandley this time. Um, did he say something about having a nurse sit with your mum? He said there was a very good nurse on that evening and he would make sure that she really pushed fluids and um, took particularly good care of mum. All right. Did he say something about um, a drug called uh, dexamethasone? Yes. What do you remember about that? He said that he was going to give her some. That was it's a steroid, so it was something that you know may help, as well as the fluids. All right. Um, Do you remember when it was on the 15th of May? Sorry, on the 14th of May that you were um, at the window, just in terms of timing, you've, you've indicated that you received a call from the palliative care specialist at 2.30 that afternoon, the effect of which was um, that she didn't think your mother was going to make it and it was too late it was too late to do things then you have this conversation with dr branley Correct. And you, um, in which he says that he hadn't given up on your mother and was still going to try and do some things you saw him with her do you remember what time that was it was around four o'clock yeah got it in my notes because that was the usual time that you visited when i booked you because I'd worked that day. Right, okay.
heading to the next day, the 15th of May. Um, did you receive a call from Dr. Bradley early in the morning? 6.40 a.m. All right, and what did he tell you then? He was worried. He'd been there at Newmarch at six o'clock. He was worried about mum. He thought the fluids and the steroids had helped slightly, but she was still critically unwell. Did he tell you anything about when she'd started on the fluid and steroids? I got told the night before and a phone call that they were reported to be running at 8.25. And I think I got that out of her care notes. Right. Um, what else did he tell you? Um, they'll try and get some nourishment into her as she was starving. Her viral load to COVID was low, so the COVID was nearly gone. And he said, and that was my interpretation, that she has her own nurse today and we'd try and get mum's fluids increased. What do you mean that's your interpretation? Meaning that there would be someone special in her, so right. it would be a one-to-one. -one. I see. Um, <clears throat> that comment just before that she was starving, hence they were going to try and get some food into her, uh, do you know what the source of that statement was, whether it was Dr Brandley relating something your mum had said or his own observation? He wouldn't have said that. That was his, they were his words. Right. From his observations. Did you then receive another call from Do Dr. Katheria Sam? Yes, I did. All right. And what, what did she say during that call? She um, rang to apologise. Because Why did she apologise? Well, because I was very upset that at 2.30 they rang me to say it was all over and she had, from the care notes, I found out that she had cancelled all treatment at 10.30 that morning. Did you know that at this time? No. Keep going. Um, so, you know, mixed messages. One doctor's telling me it's no good and the other doctor was telling me that there's still hope. So obviously they weren't communicating. That was my interpretation of that. Right. And did she tell you, any, besides apologising, did she, do you remember her telling you anything more specific than that? Um, she went, she did go on for quite a while saying that how apologetic she was and that, you know, if it was her mum, she would think of comfort first. So, you know, that, you know, we were keeping her, keeping mum in a, situation where maybe she would have been better off not being here. Um, I, I actually, she, as I said, I said we were on, on a roller coaster ride with this because, you know, yes, no, yes, no. And she said that they were as well. Right. Was there any specific reference in that phone call to the issue of fluids? Um, yes. She, again, she apologised. She, um, she said, she told me that Dr. Branley, the medication that he ordered, that she was um, getting them, receiving them. She didn't think that they worked, would work. As the fluids and tubing wasn't available, we have lost the window of opportunity. Who they, said that? They were her words. I would never refer to fluids and tubing. Right. I would just say IV fluids. So you, you recall her telling you that because the fluids and tubing weren't available, we have lost the that you'd lost the window of opportunity. Yes, they were her words. Um, was that the only call you received from Dr. Katheria Sun? No, I believe she rang again, again to apologise for the mixed messages. Right. Yeah, she she asked if I was upset about it. <laughs> She asked you if you were upset about, about it. About the mixed messages, which of course I said I was. All right. I mean, she was very lovely and apologetic and, and appeared to be a very kind-hearted doctor, but that's, they were what she said. Okay. Now, on the 16th of May, the following day, um, was there another, was this the second occasion that you went inside the facility to be with your mum? Yes. And once again in PPE gear, I take it. Yes. 
Um, does it follow from that that she had deteriorated again? Well, yes, that was our belief mm. until we went inside the room. And, and how was she? Well, she opened her eyes. She smiled at us. Um, we'd already asked if we were wearing gloves, could we touch her? And they said yes. Um, so she was holding my hand. She was visibly thirsty again, licking her lips. Are you thirsty? Do you want a drink? Again, there was no water or straws in her room. I asked for her to be given a, to get a drink. I put it to her mouth. She gulped and gulped. So, of course, she's coughing and spluttering. Um, Monica Tucker, the RN, was in the room with us. She said, oh, would you like a cup of tea, Alice? To which mum said, yes, please. So a cup of tea was got. I don't think that she actually had the cup of tea. It, it came into the room. Um, we FaceTimed home at Joyce's, at where she lived, where the grandkids, the granddaughters, great-grandkids were there. Mum was saying hello to them, waving, smiling, still holding my hand, this hand. Yeah. And... Outside the window was my other sister, Alison, and our three husbands. All of a sudden, my mother grabbed my hand, screamed at Joyce, looked at Mark outside the window and was screaming at the top of her voice, Mark, Mark, get me out of here. Get my shoes. Take me home. Get me out. And it was, as you can tell, very disturbing. Um, she she was, her little skinny legs were doing this, trying to get out of the bed. Um, people were coming into the room and standing, like not forcibly holding her down, but, you know, standing either side of the bed so she couldn't get out. She just, take me home, Mark, take me home. She, where's my shoes? Um, a doctor came into the room and... Mum was so upset, they said they would give her something to calm her down, which we were happy to do because she was so distressed. We could have done with some drugs at that point. We were so distressed as well. Um, I held my mum's hand while they were injecting her. She grabbed my hand, she flung it into the air and she just said, get! Um, I waited in the room until she, um, until she was calm. I, we went outside. We were coming back. That was the morning. We were coming back again around lunchtime. We asked the staff not to disturb mum. So we just wanted to go and sit at the window and, and look. Um, I had... Monica Tucker rang me as we were going to the car park. She came and saw Joyce and I and she told us that that was mum saying goodbye to us and to the family. We, we didn't know any better. So we went, we came back at, I think it was around 12.30 or one. We went to the window because they had a system, a very, system that, you know, they'd let the people know that someone was coming to the window so they could open the blinds, et cetera, and <clears> someone <throat> come in the room. And the person that came in the room turned the light on and said, Alice, Alice, your family's here. Immediately my mum jumps up, tries to get out of bed, screaming and making all sorts of, you know, wanting to get out. Legs were going frantically let me out, let me out. I had Monica's mobile phone number because she had just recently rung me and I said, I rang her and I said, my mum is not comfortable. She is not, I don't, she's not comfortable. She's not settled, you know, help. And they all came into the room. The doctor came into the room as well. While this was going on, I got a phone call from Dr. J telling us that it was now time to um, do the whole palliative care thing, um, 
her comfort must come first. She needed to be um, calmed and sedated and that they would start the syringe driver with the morphine and the midazolam. Do you know whether she'd received morphine or midazolam before that? I know in the morning visit she was given something to sedate her. Right. But I don't know what drug. And I'm not referring now to what you know from medical notes that you're able to look at, just in terms no, of what you were told at the time. In the, in the morning visit? Yes. When she was hysterical, they gave her something to calm her down. I was no. in the room. Do you know what it was? What? No, they, if they told me, I didn't even hear. Right. But um, at least by this after, that afternoon, after this second episode, you were then contacted by the palliative care specialist who told you it's now time to move to those medications. Absolutely. Right. <clears throat> Um, your mother passed away three days later, on the 19th of May, just after midnight. Correct. Um, and I take it you visited her in between, in the interim period? Yes. Yeah, I went back on the Monday, the day prior. That was for another window visit? No, I went inside. You went inside. And at that point, was she responsive? Um, after your mother passed away, did you have any conversations with any of the treating doctors? Um, I received a call that later that day from Dr. J. Yes. Who assured me that mum passed away peacefully and didn't require any top up of the medication. Right. Um, although to your understanding, she had the syringe driving morphine yes. at that time. So she was receiving a flow of morphine. Yeah, and midazolam. And midazolam as well. Um, did you speak with any other doctors I, after your mother passed? I spoke to Dr Branley on some weeks later, which would be in my notes somewhere, because I was desperate to find out mum's pathology results from that Wednesday. It was in June, I think. <coughs> I think it was the 17th of June I spoke to Dr Branley. He, right. he knew that I wanted to speak to him because I'd been making frequent calls to Newmarch um, and speaking to Eric, wanting um, initially to read Mum's notes, and then I wanted a copy of the pathology results from the blood test they took on that Wednesday. There's a reference um, in the medication records. Um, I don't require it to be put up on the screen, but it's um, tab 10 of this volume, volume 19, at page 1152. There's a notation that on the evening of the 14th of May, it appears at 8.39 in the evening, um, that your mother was administered um, a medication called haloperidol 
H A L O P E R I D O L. Um, are you aware of your mother being on that particular medication? No. Um, were you ever told that your mother was placed on an antipsychotic medication? No. I should indicate that was administered according to the notes on one occasion only at that time. Um, but do you know anything about that? Um, Ms Watson, you've seen at the, at the conclusion of, it, of the evidence of each family member that there's been opportunity to, to make um, comments about uh, important aspects of the experience that the family has had. Is there something that you would like to say to His Honour um, in respect of your mother and her experience? Yeah, there's some good and some not so good. Uh, firstly, we always were happy at Newmarch. Um, Mum did have a few problems along the way. They were always treated appropriately. The grievance policies were always followed. She enjoyed the company of her friends that she made there. She enjoyed the, the fellowship, um, the church services. Um, it, it was her home. We knew she settled when we have her out and she'd say, take me home now. But unfortunately, when COVID occurred at Newmarch, um, things just fell apart. The, the, I do not believe that there was um, enough preparation to deal with an outbreak of such I think everybody sort of must have thought that it would never happen. And when it did happen, um, basic, basic care was not able to be administered. I really believe that my mum's not ability to maintain her nutrition, her hydration and her care ended up being the factors that um, she was not able to survive that. I was so with when I read her notes and I saw the um, terminal agitation from that particular day because that was such a traumatic event for all of us. I was determined to look at her pathology results and it took a good two months to get them. But I did. Dr. Branley did end up sending them to me and it was quite evident from those results that mum was suffering from dehydration. She was malnourished. Her electrolyte imb was it, there was an electrolyte imbalance. Um, her care notes, her handwritten care notes, said that she had blood in her urine and it was offensive, which to me signals that maybe she had a UTI. And a combination of all of those things happening to my mum would have. Um, displayed in some kind of agitation and delirium. And I don't believe that that was ever considered on that Saturday when they decided that she was terminally agitated. And, and that's something that I would like answers to moving forward. I did make some notes. <laughs> um, we were very grateful for Newmarch when after we went, when we sent a letter to Grant and window visits were organised, that um, relieved so much pressure, even though we were escorted and often um, had someone standing over our shoulders, we were happy that we were able to be able to get in and see our loved ones. And I really feel that I was, I hospital in the home will haunt me forever. I truly believed what I was told as far as everything that my mum would require would be given at Newmarch. Now to me, I've been in a hospital. They have x-ray machines, they have ultrasounds, they, there's a pharmacy that has drugs, they have cupboards with fluid, there's 
sterile equipment, ultrasounds, I thought that would all be moved to Newmarch. I mean, when I went there and they talked about checking on mum, they said, oh, we'll go and see the, we'll go to the ward. That's a hospital. What I witnessed when I went in there three times was, was not a hospital. A hospital was up the road at Nepean, which I believe their COVID ward was um, not used very much. So in hindsight, I wish I didn't believe a hospital in the home. I don't think a nursing home was the place to have ill elderly people who required specialist care from professional staff who had the skill set to recognise urinary tract infections, um, hydration, nutrition, um, pressure area care. I mean, my mum should not have developed a pressure area sore. I had no idea that it was as bad as it was until I saw the pictures. Otherwise, I would have been jumping up and down out the front again. So as much as we mum had four good years at Newmarch, her last few months were something that will haunt all of us forever. Thank you. Thank you, I have more questions. Thank you. Um, Ms. Walton, I'll just check with the other lawyers whether they might have any questions for you, if you would bear me, with me for a moment. Um, Ms. Clark, do you have any questions for Ms. Watson? No, no questions, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, Mr. Palfrey, do you have any questions? No, thank you, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, Ms. Davidson, do you have any questions for Ms. Watson? No questions, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fordham, any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Richardson, do you have any questions for Ms. Watson? All right, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Watson, there are no more questions. Um, thank you very much for your words at the very end and obviously for um, being here today to give evidence. Um, you're welcome to leave the witness box now. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honour, the last witness today is Ms Helen Porter. She's the last family witness uh, in this section of the inquest and Mr Harris will be examining Ms Porter. Thank you. Thank you. I call Helen Porter. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, please say I do. I do. Thank you, ma'am. Please have a seat. <clears throat> Now, if you feel comfortable to do so, you can remove your mask. Thank you. Can you give us your full name? Helen Diana Porter. Thank you. And Ms Porter, you are the half-sister of Victor Stone, is that right? Yes. Um, I'm going to... Do you recall preparing a statement with uh, Detective Nikki Sandler uh, on the 20th of August 2020? I do. Um, I might ask you to be shown a copy of that statement now. Could the witness be shown volume 13, part one, tab four, please? Thank you. 
Do you recognise that to be a statement that you prepared on the 20th of August 2020? Yes. Um, have you had a chance to read that recently? No. Okay. When you prepared that statement, did you tell the police the truth? Yes. I'm going to be asking you some questions about that. Um, I'm just going to start by asking you a few questions about Victor. Um, as you tell us in your statement, uh, Victor had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Is that right? Yes. He took some medication for that, didn't he? He had injections once a month. And during most of his adult life, am I right that Victor did not live with you and indeed you did not have contact with him? Is that correct? No, he didn't. Um, you understand that he lived at one point for, for a period of time with your mother, is that right? Yes. And also for a period of time with Gay, who is his sister, is that correct? No, I didn't know he lived with her. You, you didn't know that he lived with her, correct. Um, there came a time when it came to your attention that Victor was not looking after himself very well, is that right? Yes. Um, just thinking about the period uh, up to about 2018, was Victor able to get himself around the place? Was he able to walk? Yes, he did. And he liked to walk, didn't he? He loved his walk from Noria. And one of the things um, uh, that he did was he would go to the TAB, is that right? Yeah, every night. And he liked to place a bet there, didn't he? Yeah. And in fact, it was on a trip to the TAB that he had a fall. Is that yes, right? Yes, he did. And although he wasn't injured very much, he needed to get an ambulance that day. Well, I was called and said that he had a fall and he was missing, which I didn't know until I was told that he was up in the pain hospital and we rushed straight up there. And did it turn out that he spent three or four weeks in the PN hospital? Yes, he did. Um, from there, was he transferred to the Springwood Hospital for a period of rehabilitation? Yes. And have I got this right, that sometime prior to Christmas 2018, Victor, in fact, moved into Newmarch House? Yes, they came up to see if he fit into the, I think, the criteria or whatever they call it, I'm not sure. And they said yes, and they took him from Springwood Hospital straight to Newmarch House. Um, do you remember you yourself looking at a number of different yes, nursing homes? I did. And do you remember what it was about Newmarch House that you decided was the right place for Victor? Cleaner. It just seemed at the time friendly. And that he'd like it there. From the time that, moved, that Victor moved into Newmarch House, were you acting as his next of kin? Yes, before that even. Even before you moved into, you moved into Newmarch House? Okay. And do you remember where he stayed in Newmarch House? Lawson. Okay. And was that in room C18? Yep. Okay. Ms Porter, I can, I can see that this evidence is upsetting you. Just take a moment. There's some water in the witness box. Sorry. That's quite all right. I'm not... Wait, are you finding it difficult bringing these things back? Just take a moment and we'll tell me if you're ready to go on with your evidence. You feel okay to go? <laughs> or do you need a break? No, no, no. You're okay? All right. I'm, I'm going to start by asking you about the early period that Victor was in Newmarch House, okay? Um, do you think Victor liked his time, his early time in Newmarch House? He loved it there. <laughs> and why do you think that? It's just he had other people around him. They were nice to him. Did he seem to be happy? He, he, he was. At paragraph 22 of your statement, you say this, you say, 
Victor had never been cared for so well in his whole life. No, it wasn't. You, and you agree that's right? Um, was it your understanding that he loved being at New March House because he felt free there? Yes. And did you visit Victor when you could at New March House? When they first took him down there, we were there every day. Uh, eight, nine months. And just in January of 2020, we started going once. I went once a week and Sean went once a week. And just thinking at that point, Ms. Porter, can you remember the reason why you started going once a week? Because we weren't getting nothing done on our own. And Victor turned around and said, you don't have to come every day. And that was, was that very much like Victor? To say that sort of thing? No. Now, Ms. Porter, you've mentioned we a couple of times and Cheryl. Is that your sister, Cheryl? Yeah. Okay. And was she also coming along to visit yes. Victor at that time? Yes. So from January of 2020, it went down to, to weekly visits for each of you. Is that right? Yes, but we'd still call in there other days for. 10 to 15 minutes just to check on him. Okay. And by this time in January 2020, had you been made aware that there were some other problems with Victor's health? No. Were you aware at some stage that he developed a form of dementia? Oh, that was at Spring, okay. Springwood, yes. Yeah. That even prior to him moving into New, New March? Yes. And just thinking of that period in January 2020, um, what was his level of function at that point? Was he able to get himself around still? Yeah, he'd be walking everywhere. Okay, and was that when he was in New March House? Yes. Um, was he able to feed himself and look after yes. his own daily yes. needs? Yeah. Um, was he talking? Yeah, he would shut up sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you tell us in your statement that, that Victor was a shy man, is that right? At first, till he got to know him, yeah. Okay. Did he like to keep him, keep himself to himself? Uh, a lot, yeah. Okay. Um, do you know whether he got himself involved in any activities at New March House? No, he didn't want to. Okay. And what about talking to the other residents? Do you know if he did? He that? did talk to some of them, yes. Okay. Um. And in, in terms of his um, movement, did there come a time when he was finding it more difficult to move himself around? Not that we know of. You say at paragraph 26 of your statement, um, you say Victor was considered low care. He was able to do all daily tasks himself up until the last couple of months of his life. And you then go on to say Victor started having trouble moving around and needed help going to the toilet. Do you recall that? No. Um, did he, do you recall him having any trouble moving around in those last couple of months of his life? Sometimes he'd get a little shuffle up, but he'd still be walking around. Um, you also mentioned, this is a paragraph 24 of your statement, that he had a regular GP while he was at Newmarch House. Yes. Do you recall that? And was that a, um, was that yeah, a doctor? Darum, was it, something like that. if I said the name Dr. Dharma Ratnam? Yeah. Is that, does that recall? Yeah. Okay. Um, and although you didn't get to choose that doctor, um, what did you think that Victor thought of that doctor? Vic didn't really like doctors at all, oh, I to be honest. But you said in your statement, this is paragraph 24, Victor really liked Dr. Dharma Ratnam. Do you remember him saying that to you? He has, but he still didn't like them all together. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just going to move forward in the timeline a little. Um, did there come a time when 
you became aware that Newmarch House had gone into lockdown? On TV, yeah. Okay. I just want to think about the circumstances where that occurred. Um, did either you or your sister try to go to Newmarch House for a visit one day? I never. Okay. Well, I did, but I was never locked out. Okay. And what about your sister, Cheryl? Cheryl went twice. I, I go on the Monday. Cheryl turned up Thursday and she was locked out. She called me and said they said there was a, some virus in there. And I went in the following Monday and the same thing happened. Cheryl turned up there, was locked out again on the Thursday. And they, Cheryl was telling me they told her it was to keep COVID-19 out and keep them safe. And, and did you, after hearing that from Cheryl, did you yourself make contact with Newmarket? I called them. And do you remember what you were told? Nothing. Do you remember if you were told that they'd been that the house was in lockdown or something to that effect? No. Um, were you, do you remember being told anything about visit uh, window visits? They never said anything to me. I seen other people having them on TV. So I called them and told them we want one. And were you able to book a window visit to go and see Victor? Yeah. I just want to ask you about that. Would you like to take a moment? I can see it's upsetting you. <laughs> Sorry. That's quite all right. Take your time. <laughs> Can I take a break, Miss Porter? It's no problem yes, at all. Please. Yes, of course. All right, we'll take a short break. Um, the court officer will let me know when we can reconvene.
in an occasion when you attended Newmarch House in order to have a, a window visit, but in fact Victor said he didn't at that point feel like seeing you. Do you, do you recall that? Yes. Do you recall what reason was given to you why Victor didn't want to see you? He felt a bit sick. Okay. But did you believe that was the reason? I didn't know why not. Okay. To. Okay. And um, did you in fact have a window visit with him that day or not? No, we didn't see him. Okay. Is what happened is that you were in the process of leaving Newmarch House when a nurse came out to see you? Me and Cheryl were talking in the car park okay. and a nurse came flying out with a phone yelling out Victor wanted to talk to us. And were you able to talk to Victor on the phone? Yes. And what did he say? He said, is that you, Holland? I said, yes. And I said, just talking to him like we normally do, we stir each other and that. And then he turned around and said he had a bit of a sore throat. And he was feeling hot. And did he also say he was feeling sick? Not to me. Okay. And did you or your sister say something to him at that point? I said, do you want to talk to Cheryl? She's here. And he said, yes. So I gave the phone to Cheryl then. And I could hear her talking to him. And she turned around and said to Victor that when to ask him to put the air conditioner on if you're hot. And he turned around and said, no, Chris, if they do that, I won't be able to breathe. Because of what he told you about being hot and the bit of the sore throat, what was going through your mind? Was COVID already in there? Okay. Are you able to help me with... Um, when this happened, this visit happened, was it a few days after the lockdown? Or was no, it, the point? it was a week or more. A week or more, okay. Can you remember the date or not? No, I don't remember dates. Okay. And I want to ask you what happened next after that. Were you able to... Um, make contact with Newmarch House after that point to find out how Victor was going? A lot of the time, no. Did you try? <laughs> yeah. Did you try making phone calls? I tried one day, and I remember, at least 12 times, and still didn't get no one on that day. Was it really hard to get in contact with Newmarch House at that time? Yep. Okay, and did there come a point in time when you became aware that a person or persons inside Newmarch House had got COVID? We've seen it on the news that a worker or something took it in there. And what went through your mind at that point? I was scared for Victor. Um, thinking from that point forward, after you became aware that COVID, that there was somebody who'd contracted COVID in the house, did you continue to try to make contact with you, Marcia? Yes. Okay. Um, was it any easier for you to make contact at that point or not? I probably got a phone call uh, seven times, a call and probably one. And you tell us in your statement that um, you say around the 8th of April, you received a, a text message and a link to something called WhatsApp um, yeah. that you said you could communicate with Victor through. Do you recall that? They said that to me and I sent one to him and I got one back. Is that one video? Yeah. And it, was it of Victor? 
It was him, but it wasn't him. Uh, what do you mean by that? It was him to look at, but it, he was getting told what to say. And he didn't just look like he did before we were locked out. I want to move forward in the timeline because there came a point when you got the news that Victor had contracted COVID. All you ask about, I want to ask about those circumstances. Um, did you make a call or did somebody call you? They called me on the 19th of April. In, in your statement, and this is paragraph 38, you say it was on the 16th of April. No, it was not. And are you sure it was the 19th? I know it was. How is it you're able to be sure? It's the same actual date as my son's birthday, but his is in July. So it's the same day as your son's birthday? But date, 19, a different month. Okay. And do you remember much about that conversation? <laughs> Only that Victor was testing the head COVID-19. That was it. Did they tell you how he was physically? At that, that time, no. In, in your, your statement, um, it says that you were told he was doing good. Do you remember being told oh, that? Not that day, no. But down the track when I kept trying to get him, and I did get them sometimes, they'd say he's good or he's okay. Did you try to call New March House for an update about <coughs> every day after that? Yes. Did, were you able to get through every day or not? No. On the days that you did get through, was somebody able to tell you how Victor was? They all they would say most of the time is he's okay or he's mostly that was it. Okay. Do they also say or he's comfortable? Yep. That was the only two words I got out of them. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you this. Um, do you recall at any point after Victor? tested positive, having a discussion about an advanced care plan or an end of life plan? I don't know who she was, but she asked if Victor had an end of life plan. I said, no, he didn't. And he does not want to go in the hospital because to him, you might was his house and he wasn't living there no matter what. So just to take that in stages, Although you don't remember who it was, you did have a conversation. With yes, somebody. sorry, yes. And do you recall whether it was a nurse or a doctor or a different it's member? A female, I don't know, I can't remember. Okay. And what you were talking about, was it described as an end of life plan or an advanced care plan or how is it described? End of life. End of life plan. Um, doing the best you can, what do you remember telling that person about what Victor wanted to happen? Victor told us and always has told me and Cheryl, he never wants to go to hospital. He wants to stay where he is because that's his home now. And we promised that would happen. Do you remember being asked about any other, I'm sorry, withdrawal that. Do you remember being asked about any different options of care Victor during that conversation? No. Your memory is about the hospital and nothing else, is that right? Yeah. Um, do you remember being told that you would be sent a form? No, that never happened. And did you ever receive a form? No, nothing was discussed. <laughs> um, did there also come a time after the point when Victor tested positive, that you were told he had had a fall? Sorry? Were you told at some point that Victor had had a fall? I honestly have been told over a dozen times he's had a fall. Can you fix in your mind one occasion after the point in time when Victor tested positive for COVID? They said they found him on the floor. And do you remember who told you that? No, it was a nurse, I think. Okay. 
Um, I just want to move you forward to the 26th of April. Um, do you recall receiving a call from somebody at Newmarch about the fact that Victor wasn't doing very well? Yes, we have had one early in the piece before we even really knew he was bad, saying he might not make it through the night. Then the next day, he's fine. How did you know that he was fine the next day? Did you speak because to I him? I spoke to him. And uh, was that the only occasion you were able to speak to him after he tested positive, or were there other occasions? That was it. Okay. Do you remember what he said? No, I can't. Uh, do you remember a couple of days after that being told that he'd had another fall? And if you don't recall that, you can say so. No, I don't. Um, at any stage after he was found to be positive with COVID, do you recall being told what medication he was going to be given? After he had COVID, when he was getting bad, they said they'll put him on morphine and oxygen. I don't know if there's something else said, I can't remember it. And were you told why he was getting those medications? Only that he'd gotten back worse. But that was it. I want to take you to the 28th of April, um, two days prior to Victor's uh, passing. Mm -hmm. you remember there being a call with a nurse that day when she held the phone out towards Victor? Do you remember that? Um, what were you able to hear? A grunting or growling noise. Did you understand that to be Victor? I thought it was. Did he say anything? Um. On the morning of Victor's passing, did you have another call with a nurse? Yes, I called them both times. I see. So on each occasion, you were the person. I called them. Call. Is that right? Okay. And on that second occasion, on the morning of his passing, was there also um, was the phone held up to Victor that day as well, on your understanding? I think it was, because it sounded like it was a funny noise that oxygen masks make. And do you remember anything else about that call? No. I couldn't take it, so I hung up after what? And it was later that day you received a call about Victor's passing? Yeah. About 3.30 that afternoon, is that right? Yeah. Um, you've, you've told us at the end of your statement, um, in the conclusion of your statement, you've, uh, paragraph 49, um, about some reflections that you have about Victor and his treatment at Newmarch House. I just, just want to ask you now, what did you think about the way that Victor was treated at Newmarch House? At the beginning, they were great with him. And then after about six months, they started not like they cared as much. Being sure I'd have to go chasing up sheets and towels and everything for him, changing his bed. <laughs> you could hardly find a nurse when you needed one. So we'd just go to every cupboard and find some. Take his bed and him. Ms. Porter, during 
the period when New March House was in lockdown. You've told us about the difficulty you had contacting New March House. And is that something you found very frustrating at the time? I was more than frustrated. How would you describe it? I don't really want to say it. That's a bit if. You've also said in paragraph 49 of your statement that um, you still don't know um, things about Victor leading up to the period when he died. Is that right? No, I don't. Think. And that's still something that you'd, you'd like to find out about. Yes, right? the need to know. Um, I asked you previously in, in your evidence about that one occasion when you, you tried to have a, a window visit with Victor, do you recall that? Yeah. After that point in time, what was your understanding of that window visit? Were they still available or not? I didn't know. Did you ever ask anybody at Newmarch House about window visits? That one time when I got one after that, it was hard to get anyone. But you, by which you mean hard to... Get any of them on the phone to find out. Um, did anybody ever tell you about window visits? No. Did you receive any emails from Newmarch House on no. that subject? No. So I take it the one that you described in your evidence it didn't actually happen. Was that the only occasion? It's the only one chance we had. Um, I asked you there only in relation to window visits, but thinking about the period of time when Newmarch House was in a lockdown, did you receive any emails from Newmarch House? Possibly. Possibly. Did, did, do you have access to an email account? I've got an email. Is that a way you received information from Newmarch House in the past? Yeah. And can you recall receiving emails from Newmarch House during the period of lockdown? Some. And in fairness to you, there's a number of documents that you put behind your um, statement uh, a number of which are letters but do you recall whether you received any of those um, by email during the period of lockdown I don't remember I'm t I just can't think um Thank you, Ms. Porter. Um, is there anything else that you want to tell His Honour about your experience of the lockdown and the events that occurred at Newmarch House that you haven't already said? My main thing is if Victor was alive. Yeah. It was so awkward with him. made him a promise that one of us would always be there with him and we couldn't and I asked if I could see Victor after he died and they said yes if I wore all that pain, that protective stuff and then after that I got a phone call saying no I just want the answers.
Ms. Porter, I, I've come to the end of the questions that I have for you. I'm just going to ask you to take a moment before he's on a sees if there's questions from anybody else. Do you understand? Do you feel ready to proceed? Yep. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions, Jonah. Thank you. Um, Ms. Porter, just bear with me for one moment. I need to check whether the other lawyers have any questions for you. Um, Ms. Clark, do you have any questions of Ms. Porter? Uh, no questions, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, Mr. Powell, for any questions? No questions, thanks, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, Ms. Davidson, do you have any questions? No, thank you, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fordham, any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Richardson, any questions? No, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, well, Ms. Porter, um, there are no more questions for you, so that means that we've finished with your evidence. Um, thank you very much for being here today. I know uh, and can see how difficult it, it was for you, so thank you very much for being here. You're welcome to leave your seat now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Your Honour, that completes the witnesses for today. Yes. The next two witnesses to give evidence uh, are Ms Emma Cardwell and Ms Monica Tucker, both of whom are nurses. Yes. They'll be giving evidence tomorrow and we anticipate that will take up the um, majority of tomorrow's time. Yes, all right, very well. Um, I will adjourn until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs>